Hi guys, my name is Alexander Hetrick. I'm a fourth year at RVU, and I am giving a presentation today on uh, burn wounds and also frostbite. So this is going to be a series split into two different lectures, and it uh, originally was meant to be for the global medicine and wilderness me medicine tracks at uh, my university. But honestly, this is a good basic uh, wound care guide. Uh, for anybody in general practice working in rural areas uh, or doing any kind of mission work uh, abroad. So this will just kind of give you a good basis um, for these clinical foundations on uh, kind of knowing how to care for these types of wounds, um, what to do at uh, on scene uh, if you're one of the first responders, um, and then also kind of give you an idea, whatever step of the process you're a part of, give you an idea of what's going to go through the longitudinal process for these injuries. So what happens at scene, what happens at the emergency room, what happens several weeks later, how re rehabilitation goes, that sort of thing. So giving you a good full view of what's going on. So this uh, first presentation is going to be on burn wounds. So I chose this topic because uh, burn injuries are super common, um, and it seems like it's getting more common these days that uh, most of the west coast of the U.S. is on fire. Um, so these kind of injuries are something uh, first responders, people in your random clinics are going to experience, people in emergency settings are going to experience with their patients, and knowing how to care for these people uh, is really going to help you out. Uh, and also, uh, while I was recording this series, uh, I kind of I learned some new stuff uh, about burn care that I myself didn't know. So this will also be good just for your personal health and safety uh, going forward. So just to kind of give you a glimpse of uh, the prevalence, uh, each year in the United State, it States, it's uh, approximated that about 2 million individuals are burned seriously enough to seek the care of a physician, and about 70,000 of these require hospitalization. Now, that's not even including uh, people who don't seek care. For one, they don't have insurance, worried about how much it's going to cost, um, think that they can handle these uh, conditions at home and let uh, these burns fester, uh, hypertrophic scar, or get bad enough uh, that they can have uh, septic wounds that they have to eventually be admitted for uh, much more serious issues. So uh, very large prevalent uh, part of our population uh, experiences these injuries every year. Um, so this uh, lecture is going to go over the pathophysiology of burn wounds, how it affects the uh, dermal surface of the skin uh, and all the layers, how you classify uh, burns uh, by um, the depth of their invasion. Um, also talking about how to approximate burn size, uh, which is very important um, uh, as, for your victims if you are either at the scene assessing, you are a smaller clinic or hospital that is referring to a larger burn care center. A lot of um, what goes into subsequent, subsequent care depends on the total body surface area that the burns uh, uh, are a part of, so that's very important. Uh, different types of burns, um, the first aid treatment on scene, what you can do at home if you yourself are burned, but you don't think it's bad enough to go to the hospital. Um, talking about inhalation injuries, uh, how to transfer uh, patients to the hospital or transfer between facilities. Uh, talking about resuscitation when in the emergency room or uh, subsequent care uh, once a patient is admitted. Uh, basic burn care, dressing wounds, uh, and then also outpatient care. So for any of you who are general practitioners, family docs, that sort of thing, uh, how you can care for these individuals just in your clinic and when you need to think about referring uh, because things are getting a little bit more serious. All right, so let's first talk about uh, burn pathophysiology. So um, this is going to mainly pertain um, to uh, burn wounds that aren't chemical burns, because we'll talk more later about it, but chemical burns kind of uh, start really uh, uh, progressing their uh, pathophysiology after um, after onset of the event. Uh, so, but for other types of burns, flame burns, skull burns, uh, flash burns, the like, uh, we're talking about um, the specific area uh, that the burn affects and um, and kind of what goes on into it. So, really, what a burn causes is coagulation uh, necrosis. So, you get denatured collagen. Um, uh, within the dermis. Uh, blood vessels are either completely destroyed or um, cut off in certain areas because of the coagulation. Uh, the uh, red blood cells within capillaries, within uh, uh, venules or arterioles, uh, start forming uh, rouleau formation, which uh, if you remember from um, just uh, 
your basic sciences, it's when they kind of uh, all stick together in linear formation. And basically what they're uh, causing is them to form small clots. And basically the area around the burn, depending how far it's uh, penetrated in depth, uh, can cause uh, stagnation of blood flow to that entire area of skin. So not only do you have the direct damage, coagulation necrosis of uh, the uh, center area, um, of that burn. You also are cutting off blood flow to that burn uh, that can bring in uh, healing factors um, to begin to clear out the dead tissue and, and form new tissue. So depending how how much stasis you have in, in the burn wound uh, is really going to determine the length of time you're uh, having to uh, uh, go for healing um, and how long you can resolve these issues. All right, continuing with uh, burn pathophysiology, uh, burns ha that have less than 10% of the total body surface area um, is generally uh, limited, all the uh, subsequent reactions and how the body responds is limited to the burn site itself. Um, so uh, within the area of the burn site, say it's on your upper arm, it's going to stay um, within that uh, upper arm site, capillary permeability is going to increase. So you're going to lose a lot of the body fluid uh, into the interstitial tissues there. Um, neutrophils are going to start to uh, marginate, migrate into the area. But again, like I was saying earlier, if there's a lot of coagulation necrosis there and um, the capillaries, um, uh, venules and arterioles have been destroyed, then they're going to have trouble uh, migrating straight into the wound uh, to begin uh, the healing process. Uh, other inflammatory cells are going to have the same issue, mac uh, monocytes, macrophages, but they are going to be uh, attracted by chemotaxis to initiate that healing process. It's just going to depend uh, how large that wound is, how much uh, of the area is affected that, how long it's going to take for them to really uh, 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 invade that area and uh, start the healing process. But uh, just kind of the general thought is uh, burns below 10% of the total body surface area are going to stay within that area. Now, if you're going above 20% total body surface area, um, which we'll talk about later how to uh, estimate that, um, the local response then actually becomes a systemic response. So again, talking about capillary uh, permeability increasing, so you're going to start losing uh, fluid into the interstitial space, not just in that local area, but across the whole body. Um, that's allowing both uh, fluid and protein from the intravascular compartment into the extravascular space, um, which again is going to uh, start uh, lowering your cardiac output because again, you have less fluid within your system. You're going to have hypovolemia um, and then cardiac output's going to fall. Um, and you're also going to get increased peripheral uh, resistance, which is going to uh, contribute to output falling and, and uh, the work that the heart has to do is going to increase. Um, and you're also going to start having increased blood viscosity because, again, um, you're not losing blood cells <laughs> out of the uh, vascular space, but you're losing the fluid. So it's going to start becoming um, quite uh, condensed. So uh, you would notice on a hematocrit that the hematocrit is raising uh, quite high. Um, the uh, decreased blood volume and cardiac output is accompanied by uh, an intense sympathetic response. So basically... Uh, uh, the body uh, knows that, hey, there's a problem. We need to shunt blood uh, to our vital organs. So it's going to lead to a decreased perfusion of the skin uh, and uh, the viscera and go ahead and shunt it to the heart brain. Um, and that decreased flow to the skin can convert a zone that was previously a zone of stasis to one that's a zone of coagulation. So basically taking all the fluid out of the uh, zone of damage is causing it all to become uh, coagulated, crusty, and increasing the depth of the burn, and also subsequently uh, how long it's going to take for that to heal. Um, the capillary uh, leak and depressed cardiac output then uh, can eventually lead to depressed uh, central nervous uh, system function. So you're getting less blood flows to the brain, decreasing CNS function, which can then lead to further cardiac uh, depression. And eventually, in healthy individuals, this will lead to cardiac failure. But with individuals who have a uh, prior history of uh, myocardial infarction, uh, coronary artery, artery disease, or something like that, uh, they're going to have uh, bad outcomes much earlier on. Because like I was saying earlier, um, 
your uh, peripheral resistance is increasing, the workload of the heart is increasing, so the oxygen demand of the heart is increasing. So you can uh, send someone into a my myocardial infarct if they have a previous uh, CAD history. So just know that anybody with uh, that, that kind of history needs to be looked at very closely. You need to keep uh, their fluids up um, and you, you need to make sure you're preventing uh, a secondary um, heart problem uh, after the burn. Um, something to know is uh, to just kind of be on the lookout. Uh, the first sign of CNS change is being uh, uh, people being very restless, followed by lethargy and then finally a coma. So going from being super jumpy getting really tired and eventually wanting to, to just sleep the entire time. Um, so just kind of be aware of that uh, set of neurological uh, issues, you know, seeing that in, in subsequent. Uh, but, you know, if you're uh, on scene and, and it's a chaotic, you know, house fire or apartment fire or something like that, it's really going to be hard to assess anybody's neurological status and kind of keep in tone with them uh, through a series of checks rather than just seeing how they are right at that moment. So um, how well that can really help you. Um, is kind of up for grabs. Um, do note that without adequate uh, resusc resuscitation, so we'll talk about later uh, what kind of colloid you use, uh, how you do um, uh, fluid resusc resuscitation burn victims. But burns um, that are 30% uh, total body surface area frequently lead to acute renal failure. So after the heart, the kidneys are, are often a problem. Um, and uh, victims with severe berms uh, it can invariably lead to really fatal outcomes. So um, somebody with 30% total surface body area is already going to be considered a very serious patient or are really going to um, uh, be treated accordingly. But that's just kind of kind of letting you know where the line is that um, really bad things are starting to happen. So below 10%, you're usually okay with local problems. Above 10%, uh, 20% is when you start getting more of those cardiac systemic problems. But 30% is where you're getting a lot of those ongoing issues that can be fatal to the patient. All right, like I said earlier, estimation of a patient's burn size is one of the most important criteria of all of this. Uh, it's going to determine uh, how you uh, do fluid resuscitation. It's going to determine how you treat the patient, whether they have to be admitted, whether they, need, they can be treated outpatient. Um, and also, if you are a smaller clinic, um, like a family doc working in the middle of a rural area, or you're just at a hospital that is not equipped to handle uh, the severity of burn you're seeing, you need to be able to give a proper uh, total body surface area estimation to uh, the refer whatever hospital you're referring them to so they can be prepared uh, to take on um, that patient and know what they're going to kind of be dealing with. So that being said, um, the general rule for estimating uh, body surface area is the rule of nines for adults. So each upper extremity, so each arm uh, accounts for uh, 9%. Uh, each lower extremity accounts for 18%. Um, the anterior and posterior trunk, so chest and back, both uh, count for about 18%. Um, the head and neck counts for about 9%. And uh, the perineum uh, counts for 1%. So these are just general estimations. There are definitely charts out there that you can get much more into getting a, a super accurate read of, of the uh, total body surface area. But if you are a um, first responder, you're in the emergency room, you're trying to make a quick estimation of uh, how much uh, this per person has burned on their body. This is this is kind of what you go with the rule of nines, um, and it's a chart you can um, just look up whenever uh, you hear patients coming in or you're at scene and you're trying to remember how to give a, a total body estimation. I'm not expecting you to to completely remember it off the bat, but uh, this will be a very handy tool for you at least remembering what is called the rules of nine. So you can Google it real quick, see an image, and uh, quickly. Uh, estimate the patient. Now it becomes a little harder with young children. Children less than four year old, uh, four years old have much larger heads and smaller thighs uh, in proportion to body size than adults do. Um, so if in an infant, the head counts for about 18%. Um, where it uh, accounted for 9% in adults. So uh, head counts for about 18% total body surface area. Um, and then uh, legs are 13.5 each. So it gets a little harder. So uh, definitely uh, for infants, I would uh, look up uh, rule of nine for infants um, uh, if you're not able to uh, quite remember it. Uh, the chest, back, arms, and uh, perineal area uh, all count for the same as they do in adults. So head and, and legs are pretty much the different ones. Um, for smaller burns, uh, and you're trying to get accurate assessment uh, on um, 
on hands, feet, genitals, that sort of thing, uh, you do need to be quite precise. Um, just uh, for for us in that in, in this circumstance, just remember the hand amounts to about 2.5 percent of the body surface area. Um, dorsal surface of the hand uh, accounts for about one percent. Um, and the palmar surface counts for about 1%, and then each of the vertical surface for about 0.5% of fingers. Really, this is gonna be done uh, much later in care. It's not gonna be a, a life-threatening injury. It's not gonna be something that you have to worry about getting um, quite precise right there in that moment at assessment. Um, but for uh, future care, follow-ups, um, grafting, that sort of stuff, you'll need to know um, how to estimate that. So just remember that if uh, it's a burn in those areas, um, that you need to look up uh, how to do the proper estimate, uh, estimation for that hand. So when you're uh, referring to uh, surgery or whatnot, you're able to give them a proper account. Okay. All right, so now you know how to estimate total body surface area for a burn. What do you do with that information? Well, basically, uh, that uh, that percentile is converted then into either uh, categorizing it as minor, moderate, or a severe type of burn. Uh, minor is, again, going to be that less than 10%. You're not having any uh, full thickness burns, um, and it's generally something you can treat on an outpatient basis. They don't need to be admitted. To you. it's, you're just going to have those local reaction, uh, and it's, it's going to be painful. So we'll talk later about how to uh, prescribe pain medication, that sort of thing, for these patients and, and what you'll need to do for follow-up. But uh, generally, these patients can be... Uh, treated on an outpatient basis. Um, things get a little bit more difficult when we're talking about uh, moderate burns. Uh, so moderate uh, includes partial th thickness burns, which we'll talk in a bit of uh, the different types of thickness, but partial thickness burns of 15 to 25% of a total body surface area in adults, uh, 10 to 20% uh, in children. So you have a little bit less of a threshold with kids. Um, and then if they have any full thickness burns of less than 10% body surface area, basically if they have a full thickness burn, um, they, then they're considering the moderate category uh, and you're most likely uh, going to admit them at least for a night um, while you're getting things started. Uh, these burns are quite quite in depth, can uh, start to uh, affect lower structures, including muscle, bone, that sort of thing. Um, you're definitely gonna need a surgical consult on those. So we'll talk more about that in a bit, but just know that basically a full thickness burn earns you uh, at least moderate stat uh, status. Um, and then uh, these would be, cons and if anything involves the uh, face, ears, uh, eyes, hands, feet, or the perineal area, genitals, um, that would be categorized as severe. So if that automatically knocks stuff up to severe, you will not have any of those in a moderate burn. Severe, again, if it affects face, eyes, ears, nose, you know, hands, feet, uh, the perineal general areas, that automatically gets you severe status because those are um, uh, very uh, particular areas you have to work with. Um, you don't want any fusion of the fingers. You don't want fusion of uh, penile skin to the leg. You don't want uh, fusion of the toes, that sort of thing. Uh, so even um, uh, if there are partial thick thickness burns to any of these areas, you have to be very, very, very careful. Um, and these are definitely going to uh, need a, um, a proper specialty consult with. Um, and then burns, uh, most full thickness burns uh, and uh, infants and older adults uh, are going to be categorized within this sphere um, uh, status. Uh, if you have a healthy middle-aged adult that uh, has a very small full thickness burn, um, you may be able to, you know, back off on how how uh, intense you're being, uh, as long as the underlying structures are uh, intact. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then again, just uh, because of the cosmetic functional risk of any of those uh, uh, danger areas, uh, face, hands, feet, um, genitals, um, you really need to um, refer it to someone with a special interest in, in a burn care in a facility that's kind of used to dealing with those problems because those can have very bad outcomes if you uh, don't take care of them property, properly. Um, and then I just gave you a little algorithm map here on the, the right side. So I left a lot of text on all of these slides so that uh, you can use them to look back to rather than having to go through a video and try to listen. OK, it was at this part. Um, so you can have these as slides for you to uh, to look back to. Uh, and all of this is based off the hour about box uh, Willner's Medicine textbook, which is crazy thick um, and really good stuff. If uh, you ever had a, have a chance to use it as a resource. OK, so. A little bit more about what you do with these uh, categorizations of burns. So again, superficial burns. Um, sorry, I misspoke earlier. It can go as large as 15%, um, uh, as long as um, 
it looks like it's not invading full depth thickness. Uh, it looks like it's within a well circumscribed area. Uh, there's no uh, comorbidities, anything you have to worry about the patient, then you can really do uh, an outpatient basis with these individuals. Uh, moderate burns uh, can be treated at a community hospital with someone who's knowledgeable in burn care, um, has a good uh, solid foundation. And you know, nowadays it's so easy to get consults um, uh, t via telemed and that sort of thing. And we all have a great community uh, working together um, uh, so even if you're in a rural area, um, you should be able to kind of at least work with uh, someone uh, via that kind of telemedicine thing to know, uh, hey, what's my next step? Do Am I going to be able to treat this here or do, do you think I should fly this out to you? Um, so just having a uh, good grasp of, of what numbers you need to call and, and that sort of thing and set up those relationships before you get those burn care patients. So you kind of have that as in your back pocket. Um, Know that adoption of early excision and grafting um, or using tissue rearrangement surgically um, to achieve early wound closure uh, has made uh, burn care more complex. Um, so you really do need training in, in these areas if it is larger full thickness burns or covering very large areas. Um, and if you think this is kind of out of your purview or they're going to have problems heal healing, hypertrophic scars, if a burn goes over a joint, um, you definitely want to be referring to a hospital with specialized care facilities to take advantage of those concepts, early excision, early uh, surgical techniques. So you get that patient more mobility in their future, again, especially if it goes over a joint, because those joints like to form those hypertrophic scars and um, have issues with mobility if you don't uh, really uh, invest into them early. Um, in general, threshold for admission of older and adults and infants should be low. So if you think it's uh, even something that moderately is, is you know, getting into a more um, moderate burn or even the severe burn ca category, uh, really, you know, if you're leaning in between both, either admission or no admission, just admit them, um, especially because uh, they have they have older adults. They have uh, usually have other comorbidities, vascular issues, that sort of thing that will compound uh, their injury. Uh, and then uh, babies, uh, again, it, like we said earlier, they're going to have a, a different kind of estimation for their toe body surface area. It's not always 100 percent accurate uh, because their age uh, can vary. Um, so if you are leaning one way or the other, just do it. And if you ever suspect that um, either a child or an adult has been abused um, and their burns look like abusive burns, uh, then you must admit them. Um, adults, you know, you, you go as far as you can um, with trying to get them to stay and trying to protect them. Uh, with, inf uh, with kids, uh, it is your prerogative to protect that kid if you even have an inkling that there's some kind of abuse going on uh, and to involve the appropriate uh, authorities, call DSF, uh, DSF and um, get them involved. And uh, just for the safety of the kid, even if it turns out to uh, be nothing, you really want to, you really don't want that on your conscience if it, uh, it doesn't. Um, one one trick uh, just to kind of remember in the back of your head is um, for uh, infants, if uh, scald burns, uh, saying, oh, uh, we ran the bath too hot and they got burned. If the scald burn spares the creases, then um, you should uh, automatically suspect abuse. I'm not saying it will be abuse, but you should suspect it because uh, when uh, an infant or a small child is uh, dipped into a boiling hot tub, they're going to recoil, and that recoil is going to fold um, their uh, their uh, legs, and so they're going to kind of spare those inguinal folds area from the scald burn. So you'll see uh, their legs, buttocks, upper back all be severely red, and then their... Uh, their inguinal area is going to be spared. Um, and that would kind of kind of show you that, hey, this this might be a case of abuse. Now, if they had uh, if they read fully all over, it might be that they just ran the bat too hot, but not enough. The, the infant recoiled. Um, but you still want to be very uh, suspect with these cases. Uh, be empathetic, but also don't miss something um, really dire. All right. So let's talk about the depth of burns and uh, how they're kind of classified. So just kind of going over um, uh, the basic layers of skin. So you have your epidermis, uh, which is the uh, intensely active layer of epithelial cells under uh, dead layers of keratinized cells. So um, it's basically, again, you have that basal layer that is constantly 
um, reproducing. And then you have the top layer of uh, squamous cells that are dead cells where it kind of form that uh, protective sheath. Um, skin appendages, so hair follicles, uh, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, everything that's within um, uh, that layer uh, also contain an epithelial cell lining going down and around them. So if you look at the picture on the right, um, you'll see where the epidermis and the dermis meet and the epidermis actually kind of dips down into the dermis to form those hair, hair follicles and such. Uh, and those are epithelialized, have those uh, basal, basal replicating cells. Um, and that's where a lot of your uh, uh, healing tissues are going to come from. So um, when you uh, burn an area um, above these hair follicles, uh, sweat glands, that sort of thing, um, and you've burned off this top layer of cells uh, almost all the way down to the dermis or to the dermal epidermal uh, junction area, uh, those um, epithelial cells living within uh, those hair follicles that dip down into the dermis that were kind of protected from that burn on that top layer um, will then start to creep out and slowly, you know, just come out oh, out of the their little pockets and then start growing uh, over the skin. It's basically an overgrowth of these epithelial cells from those pockets that uh, gets your healing uh, to come across. Um, and as these cells reach the, the surface from those pockets, they spread laterally to meet their neighbors, uh, all join hands and friends and create you a new epidermal layer. Um, and then talking about the dermis, which is right under the epidermis, it's very metabolically active, but it has no regenerative uh, capacity. Um, so if the dermis is healed, or, uh, sorry, if the dermis is injured, um, eth epithelial cells must eventually cover the surface of the dermis before the burn is healed. So they must come from both sides. It's basically if you had two pe a bunch of people on both sides of the Grand Canyon, you basically just have to keep throwing them in until you fill up the entire canyon um, because there's no uh, replicating cells within that canyon. So that's a very bad <laughs> analogy, but yeah, that's basically uh, how it's going. Um, as the burn extends deeper into the dermis, fewer and fewer appendages are made. So again, uh, fewer of those pockets with those epithelial cells that can replicate, can um, overgrow and get you that new skin layer. Uh, and so they have to travel farther and farther uh, to meet each other to cover that surface skin. So again, the Grand Canyon analogy. Um, when the burn extends beyond the deepest layer of the skin uh, appendages, the wound can only heal by uh, epithelial ingrowth from the edges, so both edges coming together, wound contraction, or sur surgical uh, uh, transplantation of skin from a different site. So these are those full thickness burns that go all the way down, take all of those um, uh, appendage uh, sites away that uh, have those replicating cells that could potentially uh, provide new new coverings. Uh, and then basically you have a big hole that uh, you have to fill with something. Uh, it either grows in from the edges or you have to cover it with uh, something from another place, an, an auto transplant of skin from another area. All right, so now that you've got your histology down, let's go back and uh, kind of talk about uh, how you classify burns uh, based on their depth of invasion. So burns are classified by increasing depth as first degree, um, then second degree is basically uh, divided into superficial par partial thickness and deep partial thickness. Third degree is basically your full thickness burns, and fourth degree is basically you have burned all the way down through muscle and all the way to the bone. Bad, bad stuff. Um, many burns have a mixture of these characteristics, and depending on how you're holding, so one, say a frying pan fell on you, um, and the area that, in say it fell flat on your leg, the area at the center of the uh, frying pan might have a uh, third degree full thickness burn, while the, where the edges of the fire, frying pan touch, you may only have a partial thickness burn. So that's how you can get these varying degrees, depending on how the burn occurred. Um, so just kind of keep in your mind, first degree burns uh, involve only the epidermis, so they don't go down to the dermis, they don't take away all the appendages, uh, they still have a bunch of those uh, replicating cells to be able to grow back over. Um, the prototype of this is a mild sunburn, so a sunburn that gets hot, red, hurts in the shower, is very uncomfortable, and then after a few days it starts to uh, fade and peel over, and so that fading peel over uh, sign, so you, you're no longer having the inflammation in the area from the injury, and it said you had a massive replication of those epithelial cells 
cells, which is causing uh, the top layer to suddenly slough off. And that's where you're getting all that peeling from. So again, it's only within that epidermal layer. It's not deep. Um, you're not having uh, it go down uh, towards the dermis. It's staying right there on top. And it's, it's usually pretty mild. Though it can be very, very painful. Um, and uh, usually uh, that is... Uh, that healing uh, desquamization uh, is happening on the fourth day. So usually these heal pretty quickly. All right, let's talk about second degree burns. And remember, uh, second degree is divided in between superficial partial thickness and deep partial thickness. So let's first talk about superficial partial thickness, blah, blah, blah. Um, this includes the upper layers of the dermis. So you're getting that epidermal layer and then you're starting to get that upper part of the dermal layer. Again, remember that's the non-regenerative layer. So it doesn't have those basal replicating cells that can heal over. So you have to um, heal over from those pocket sides uh, from overgrowth of those epithelial cells. So you're getting just that upper superficial uh, part of that dermis uh, involved as well. Character characteristically, these kind of burns are forming blisters and these blisters have fluid, um, Fluid collection. Usually, they're uh, you're they're, you're getting separation at the uh, dermal epidermal junction, and so they're going to be these big thick blisters um, with tons of fluid inside them. So that's what's kind of telling you that you're getting more into the superficial partial thickness burns. So again, really bad sunburns. You can you can get this. So don't sunscreen people. Sunscreen. Um, Blistering may or may not occur for several hours after the in injury. So again, you may think you have a mild sunburn. It turns out to be a very severe sunburn that night. Um, and uh, burns are usually initially thought to be first degree because of this. So they're super red, but you're not seeing a bunch of blisters. But then the next day, it's like, oh, yeah, that's a that's a partial thickness burn. That's pretty bad. Um when the blisters are removed, the wound is really pink and wet, and it's really painful when it's contacted by any airflow, rubbing of clothes, anything like that. Super, super sensitive. Um, if you were to touch it and put pressure over it, it will blanch under pressure because you're kind of seeing that top flow of those capillaries underneath, and you're really getting a good view of them. Um, and you're also having tons of inflammation that is increasing blood flow to the dermis in that area of uh, skin where it's been uh, affected. Um, so if infection is prevented, superficial partial thickness burns usually uh, heal within about three weeks uh, without, you know, a ton of stuff you have to do to them. I mean, you can put some uh, good aloe vera gel on it, prevent thromboxane uh, formation. You can uh, uh, keep them covered. You don't want any further uh, insult to injury, especially with the sun. Um, and usually you can get about three weeks without functional impairment. You don't you can do this outpatient. You don't really need to worry about um, admit or anything with that. Um, and they rarely, rarely cause hypertrophic scarring unless you have a patient with a history of hypertrophic scarring, then you really want to be careful with that. Um, and pigmented in individuals, so um, uh, people of different uh, sk uh, skin tones of color, um, their healed burns may not match uh, the burn, the color of the surrounding skin. So um, the inflammation, it's really the inflammation aspect. So if you have a a person uh, with black skin and they have some kind of insult to injury, not just burns. This can be um, cuts, bug bites. Um, uh, you can have, uh, like if they have moles removed, that sort of thing. Um, you have an inflammation aspect after any of those uh, instances. And the inflammation is actually what makes the melanin lose its pigment. Pigment. Sometimes you can have the pigment come back uh, several months later, but with burns, often you're, you're burning away a very large portion of that uh, epidermis, and if you're uh, in the partial thickness burns, a uh, part of that dermis too, so you can take away some of those melanocytes and stuff. So when the skin grows back, it, it often will be a different color. So do warn your patients about that, um, uh, that so they don't think later on, hey, this is because you didn't properly take care of this. No, this is because this is this is kind of the reaction towards uh, your your skin tone, um, and that way they're not mad with you later on and say, hey, I should have gone to a plastic surgeon. So just just something to be aware of. All right, so deep partial thickness. So again, this is the other type of second, second degree, and this is basically you're going deeper into that dermal layer. Um, deep partial thickness burns also blister, um, but the uh, wound surface uh, is usually a mottled pink and white color rather than that bright pink uh, red color. Um, 
uh, immediately after the uh, the injury. Um, so it, it's kind of going to be feeling like you're seeing uh, down to the fascia, but really it's just that mottled pink and white color, um, just because you're getting even deeper uh, into that dermis. You may be down to fascia, but it's, it's definitely gotten quite that far down unless you're getting more into full thickness burn territory. But um, uh, the dermis also can appear dry with cherry red color. Again, so it's it's got a little bit of variability to it. Don't, uh, with anything derm related, never think that one thing is always going to look this way. It's, it's going to be a characteristic of a bunch of different types of things, depending on how far you went down uh, with the, the burn, their skin type, um, and uh, the thickness of skin in the area that got burned. So it's going to differ based on the that kind of stuff. So um, just something to keep in mind. You are going to have the blistering um, and you are going to, um, have a little bit of uh, different colors you're seeing uh, underneath those blisters. Um, victims usually complain of discomfort rather than pain because you've started getting uh, the end of those uh, free nerve endings, so uh, they won't be hurting um, as much. Uh, sometimes on the periphery of the wounds, they're going to have a lot more pain because those nerve endings are more intact. Um, and the wound is often less sensitive to touch than uh, the surrounding normal skin, like I said, because that surrounding area of margination is going to have those nerves intact and is going to, that's going to be where you're going to feel most of your pain directly over it uh not as much if it's going if it's uh and again depending on how the burn happens you can have areas more superficial and others deeper so you could have areas that are more painful and others that are not so again this is all a spectrum um by the second day after the burn, the wound um, may be white. It is usually pretty dry. Um, so something you really need to watch out for is desiccation of these wounds. You uh, have completely or almost completely lost uh, that skin protective barrier. So you really, we'll talk about later how to do dressings and stuff, but you really want to keep these wounds hydrated. Again, we talked about the coagulation necrosis earlier. Uh, if these wounds desiccate, get really dry, uh, you can cause further injury from coagulation necrosis that um, makes this go even deeper. So you do want to be careful to really care for these uh, these wounds and make sure they properly heal uh, and are, are cared for. Um, if infection is present, uh, prevented, um, burn, uh, these kind of burns heal in about three to nine weeks, so a lot longer than just the superficial partial thickness because you have a lot more um, area and depth to transverse for that epithelialization. Um, and invariably, they do uh, so with a considerable scar formation. You can get keloid scarring, scarring you can get, uh, which is the hypertrophic scarring. And then um, if they have a history of that type of scarring, it may be even more so. You may want to work uh, closely with someone who uh, is knowledgeable in burn care or um, talk with someone uh, who is in dermatology in their area for uh, uh, caring for the scar formation um, soon after. Because if you're going to have any, um, for those hypertrophic scars, if you're going to have any effect on them, it's going to be early on in the, in the wound healing. So just kind of have that in the back of your mind. Um, and unless active physical therapy is continued throughout the healing process, if it's over a joint, uh, that joint function may be impaired uh, with hypertrophic scars. Um, and uh, for some reason, uh, personally in pigmented individuals and in children, um, this kind of becomes uh, inevitable um, if you're not doing that early um, uh, uh, movement physical therapy stuff, which we'll talk about at the end of this, uh, this video. All right, let's talk about full thickness burns. So this is basically third degree burns, but we call them mostly uh, full thickness at this point. Um, this is when you've gone past the dermal lining. So the differentiation between um, deep partial thickness burns and full thickness burns can be very small. Um, basically, a partial thickness burn can go all the way to the uh, dermal um, uh, junction. Uh, not the dermal epidermal junction, but all the way down to, to the base dermis. Um, it can go, the uh, deep partial thickness burn can go all the way there, but not cross that junction and be uh, classified as the um, deep superficial partial thickness, or deep partial thickness burn. Um, but once it crosses that junction and goes past the dermis layer, even by a millimeter, then it is now a full thickness burn. And it is a little hard to differentiate uh, full thickness and partial thickness, uh, deep partial thickness burns sometimes, um, because they have a lot of similar characteristics. So you're gonna have that kind of dry, thick, leathery, white 
area that does not blanch under pressure with full thickness burns. Um, with the partial thickness burns, again, you can have a little bit of variability. Sometimes it'll be white, sometimes it'll be pink. Usually it will still blanch a bit under pressure um, with the partial thickness because you still have some of those um, uh, capillaries uh, within uh, that tissue that you can see the blood flow underneath. Um, but with full thickness burns, you've already gone past all of that and you are no longer seeing blanching under pressure. It's going to be hard, leathery, white, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, and again, on the periphery of the wound, depending on how the wound was formed, you could have partial thickness on the periphery and then just in the center having that full thickness. So again, it can be, depending on how the wound was formed, it can be a little, a little different. So you kind of have to keep it up in mind with them. Um, and then uh, full thickness burns develop a classic burn eschar. So an eschar is basically a structurally intact but dead uh, denatured dermis. Um, so basically it's burned through that dermis. It is, the dermis is still there, but it is completely dead. It's completely eradicated all structures with the dermis, um, but it's still there and it's kind of blocking formation of new tissue kind of laying down. Um, it is going to block um, uh, regeneration of um, uh, blood flow, capillaries, and that sort of thing. So um, we'll talk later about debridement and that sort of thing. Just know that full thickness burns is where you're getting this charred uh, dermis that you you have to do something with uh, that does become a problem with healing. Whew. All right. So we've gotten through the more uh, histology portion of our of today's show. Um, basically, we talked about how, how deep these burns go and how you classify them. Now let's talk about how these burns happen, um, the different types of burns, uh, what their inciting factors are, usually, you know, how they present uh, and what you do about them. OK, so let's start out with scald burns. This is invariably the uh, most common uh, type of burn. Um, and it's usually a uh, resultant of hot water. So water at uh, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, I am filming in the USA, so <laughs> I'm using Fahrenheit, but I also have the Celsius uh, readings on there, but I'm not gonna read both out uh, each time. But water at 140 degrees uh, develops a uh, deep partial thickness or a full thickness within, within three seconds. Um, so uh, hot water on a steaming kettle, um, be super careful. Um, because they can they can get you good. Uh, you can get as far as deep partial thickness uh, to all the way to a full thickness. So be very careful. Um, getting up towards 156 degrees. That's usually what most of us who drink our our daily uh, caffeine <laughs> bolus uh, get at for brewing our coffee. Um, and then uh, an automatic percolator. So automatic coffee uh, machine would be uh, about 179.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are all. Uh, way past what you need uh, to get a full partial thickness burn in within a second or two. Um, boiling water almost always causes uh, really deep burns. Soups and sauces, which are thicker, remain in contact with the skin much longer. It's, it, you can't really wipe it away. Um, and so basically it stays on your skin uh, and keeps and keeps burning. It has a thicker cons consistency. It can hold more heat, has more resistance to te uh, temperature flow, so it can hold more and burn you longer. So be, those, those can uh, often cause uh, more severe burns than just uh, boiling water. Um, in general, exposed areas tend to burn, be burned less deeply than areas covered in clothing. Um, say you are wearing a long sleeve shirt, you uh, pour soup over your hand and uh, arm covered with a shirt. Um, your hand, you're probably going to be able to wipe off fairly quickly. Um, but if you're trying to wi wipe off uh, soup off your shirt sleeve, it is already uh, permeated that shirt sleeve, burning the skin underneath. And even if you wipe off that very top, there's that amount that's been soaked into the shirt um, that's still burning you. So uh, if you do pour some, if if you have uh, something poured over clothes, some something that is keeping uh, the burning liquid in contact with your skin, strip, get it off, wipe it off, uh, and then we'll talk about cooling and stuff you can do for it later. Um, so uh, immersion skulls, which so, you know, skulls from being in the bath uh, and that sort of thing, um, usually are deep and severe burns. Um, although water may be uh, a bit cooler than a uh, spill scald, you're usually in contact much longer. Uh, so kids in the bath who are in a bath way too hot for them. Um, so and or uh, if you're uh, in an old folks home taking care of people who can't uh, bathe or shower themselves and you're using water that's too hot, that sort of thing. Um, a little trick is testing um, water on the inside of your wrist, not your hand or your fingers or anything, the inside of your wrist because your skin is quite thin there. You're very sensitive there and you can appropriately uh, 
gauge at how hot the water is going to be uh, for a child or uh, an older adult and make sure it's cool enough. You're not going to burn someone. Um, skull burns from grease or hot oil, generally uh, deep partial thickness or full thickness burns. Um, they're more viscous, hold a lot more heat. Uh, cooking in oil grease when hot enough to use for cooking uh, can range as uh, far as up to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So they can uh, burn through to full thickness within a second. Um, and usually when someone gets uh, hurt by grease, uh, oil, that sort of thing, they freak out. Uh, drop the spatula they're using in into the pan, cause a bigger splash that like gets more grease on them. So usually, <laughs> they they it's not just the first uh, little pop that they get hurt with. It's it's that uh, reaction um, that they get hurt. All right. So as we're going through these types of burns, I'm going to also give you kind of just a quick uh, snapshot of what you do for treatment at the scene. If it's just you at home, what you should do as a first responder, that sort of thing. So victims with scalds uh, or grease burns uh, should be removed uh, away from the source of heat, uh, which kind of seems obvious. But basically, if they still have clothes that have any of that fluid on them strip it. Um, if uh, it's a super something that is sticking to the arm, get a cloth, wipe it off immediately, um, that sort of stuff. Um, wet clothing, um, wraps, anything like that needs to be removed. Um, and uh, and then accidents uh, resulting from cooking indoors with grease, grease are usually particularly hazardous because uh, grease fires. So th again, like we said, they get a pop from grease hopping out of the pan. They drop the spatula into the pan, causing grease to go everywhere, including on the person. So they burn the person, but then they also start a house fire, um, which then you can have smoke inhalation. You can have further uh, flame burns and that sort of thing. So um, grease fires are scary um, and they can rapidly become a, a much worse problem. Now we're going to talk about the distant relative to the scald burns, and those are tar burns. Uh, and this is just something to know for anybody working uh, in any kind of cityscape. If you're having anybody laying down tar, they can get these kind of burns and kind of knowing how to how to uh, work with them, especially if you're a first responder or working in the emergency room, because you're most likely going to be the one seeing the, these individuals. But tar and asphalt burns are pretty uh, special, but they're still a type of scald. Uh, the mother pot, which sits at the back of the roofing or um, or asphalt truck, um, maintains a tar at a temperature of 204 uh, to 260 degrees Celsius, which again would be 400, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's hotter than grease, which we talked about earlier, grease being up to 400. So we're hotter than grease. Uh, tar and asphalt is much more viscous, stickier than grease. Um, so uh, burns caused by tar from, directly from the mar mother pot are going to be full thickness, no matter what. They're hot enough to uh, create that full thickness burn within a second, um, and they stick. They stick to the, uh, the individuals and keep burning. Um, they can't wipe it off because it's so viscous, so uh, sticky and nasty. It stays on until that full transfer of heat and equi equilibrium has been reached. So it keeps burning uh, even, even after that initial uh, onset. So nasty, nasty stuff. Be really appreciative to all of our, our, our workers who do our roofs, who do our, um, our roads. Just really just have that in mind that, that this is one of the risks they face. So. Uh, gives you a deep appreciation for people in other fields. Um, and unfortunately, because of how sticky it is, how it adheres, you can't get it off. Even after, you know, you've equilibrated, equilibrated I can't say that word, um, and uh, you're no longer having uh, the continued damage going on, you can't see what the actual damage is underneath because it's covered with the sticky, nasty tar. So what do you do? Well, um, Usually use petroleum-based ointment if you're in the clinical care setting. So if you're in the emergency department, uh, use Vaseline or some other kind of emollient that is going to help um, get the stuff off. Uh, usually takes uh, several hours for it to to really start to work off. Um, and um, and that's kind of where you're at. Again, one, well, one of the nice things is these are full thickness burns. So while the surrounding area is going to still hurt quite a bit, um, the area directly in the middle with the, the deep... Um, full thickness burn is going to have those nerves burned away. So you're not going to have so much pain directly in those areas, but the, the removal of the tar and stuff is not going to feel pleasant. So again, we'll talk about pain control later on. Um, if you're in the field, you know, you're not going to be able to get into the hospital or something or a rural area. Um, 
anything that you're, you're not going to have direct access to what you need. Mayonnaise can actually serve uh, as uh, an emollient. So if you have any, your lunch is packed away, go through everybody's lunchbox, find the mayonnaise and throw it on um, the tar. It takes about um, uh, two, two to four hours uh, for the tar to be removed this way. And you can keep uh, massaging it in, removing uh, the old layers of it, applying new layers of mayonnaise and that sort of thing. Basically you do the same thing with Vaseline, but that's just kind of a neat trick you can do. Um, makes you wonder what it's doing to our stomachs. But um, once, once the tar has been removed, then you can really start assessing um, uh, the depth of the burn. But what you can assess at scene is total body surface area that the burn is covering because you can basically just uh, assume that anything with that black tar over it uh, is going to have a burn underneath. So you can go ahead and start uh, estimating that. All right, the next most common uh, type of injury after skulls are flame burns. Flame burns are um, generally caused by house fires. Um, and this has decreased uh, quite a lot in the past couple of decades, well, past several decades, uh, because of smoke detectors, fire alarms, that sort of stuff, usually uh, result from careless smoking and proper use of flammable liquids, uh, automobile accidents, space heaters, stoves, grease fires, um, uh, kids playing with gas and, and or uh, trying to burn something out in the back in a trash can, that sort of thing. I've, I've actually worked on kids that... Uh, did that. Um, so it's super common. And, um, and you also have to worry about smoke inhalation uh, with these types of fires, especially if it's indoors, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, victims whose uh, bedding or clothes have been on fire rarely escape without uh, some type of full thickness burn because they're not able to get the clothes off, uh, the bedding off, whatever, uh, in time um, to uh, prevent um, that full burn, uh, you're keeping contact uh, with that uh, uh, burning substance long enough to, to keep causing damage. Um, another super common thing is for summertime, uh, outdoor misadventures causing burns. Um, cooking stoves fueled by uh, white gasoline, um, taking lanterns into tents, which you know nowadays I don't think is too big an issue with LED lights and all that. Um, smoking while in sleeping bags is actually still a huge thing. Um, sleeping bag materials are highly flammable. Um, do not do this. You Bad things will happen. Um, if we're more in the winter months and someone has a little um, gas heater or something they're putting in their tent, that's bad for a number of reasons, but you know, people do really stupid things a lot of the time. Um, and then, but I, I would say by far uh, the most uh, common is campfires. Uh, trying to start uh, campfires with gasoline, kerosene, anything like that, saying so having a big flame burn uh, shoot up and someone not being prepared for it. Um, and then also people uh, being drunk around campfires, tripping into campfires, having kids who trip back into campfires. Oh, so sad, but it really happens often. Um, a lot of the Barron Care Centers, uh, especially in the uh, Midwest and West, that is a ton of what they see is kids um, uh, coming in, being flown all, all over the place uh, because of injuries from campfires. Uh, and then coals as well, uh, stepping on hot coals, and that sort of thing. We'll go over uh, coal burns here in a bit too. Um, but yeah, basically out during the summer, outdoor activities causing burns, super common. Don't usually get smoke inhalation damage from these because you're in an outdoor ventilated environment. Smoke inhalation damage almost always occurs in a closed environment. Um, most accelerants, gasoline, kerosene, propane, diesel, all of them, similar ignition te temperatures of 410 to 536 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty similar to that of the uh, mother... Um, the mother pot and the tar trucks, um, again, way more than you need to um, be getting those full thickness burns. Um, and uh, again, if it catches clothes on fire and that sort of thing, you're going to have a, a much deeper um, burn as well. So uh, as a first responder or anybody around the person, uh, first responder, basically, you know, first one to see them and help them. Um, is remove their injured person from the source of heat. So if their clothing is caught on fire, if it's jacking, you can rip it off and rip it off. And if it's pants and that sort of thing, you can't rip off quickly, lay them down, slowly roll them on the ground to, to smother the fire. If you uh, have water, use it um, immediately, trying to douse the fire. Um, if you don't have water, use a blanket. If you don't have a blanket, roll them. That's basically kind of kind of the way to go. Uh, most of these, um, the deeper, worse flame burn injuries are because uh, clothes, hair, um, 
uh, jackets, whatever catches on fire and isn't put out and they, and they continue that burn, uh, and it keeps spreading. So that is something you really, uh, need to be, that's your first priority. Get the flame out, get them away from the flame, do whatever you can. Um, once the burning stopped, um, remove any clothing that they, uh, have on around the burn. So cut it off, rip it off, whatever you do, can do, because most of the fabrics we use nowadays aren't pure cotton. They're some kind of synthetic melt, especially if you're out, uh, in a camp setting or something. Most of us, um, especially hikers, that sort of thing are wearing more synthetic fibers, um, uh, stuff that is breathable, you know, rain jackets, anything like that. Um, usually have tons of synthetic material that melts, leaving adherent uh, tissue on the skin of the burn, which becomes really, really, really painful to peel off, um, especially around the edge areas. If it's full thickness burn, not so much around that center, but if you have a, you, uh, you get away with more partial thickness um, or deep partial thickness stuff, then it's going to hurt. Um, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be pleasant. So yeah, uh, get that clothing off of them. Um, and we'll talk about cooling in just a bit. So the next most common type is flash burns. Um, these are usually explosions, natural gas, propane, gasoline, anything like that. Again, trying to uh, light a um, uh, fire and using way too much gas and then having a big whoosh of flames come up that you don't catch fire, but you get that flash burn just to that upper um, dermal layer, uh, epidermal layer. Um, and it's basically anything that causes intense, intense heat for a very brief amount of time. It doesn't keep burning you, but you have that uh, initial onset, kind of like uh, the kids burning their eyebrows off, uh, playing with fire and that sort of thing. Um, flash burns generally have distribution over um, any exposed area of skin um, that was kind of in the path of the outward uh, flame. Uh, usually it's not enough to catch clothes on fire or... Um, uh, or burn underneath the clothes, but any exposed areas of skin, it's going to uh, burn that skin. It's going to burn those hair follicles and that sort of thing in the area of the direct path of the flame. Not going to get so the heat is going to dissipate around the edges. So you're not going to get as much of a problem around the edges, but in anywhere you're getting that direct middle uh, of the path, you're going to burn. Um, flash burns are usually uh, partial thickness, so you can get anywhere from superficial partial thickness to deep partial thickness, depending on how hot the flame was, how big the flame was. Uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, depending on that, you could treat this in more of an outpatient setting. Um, and generally, uh, these burns heal without needing grass or anything else. You just burn away that top epidermal layer, maybe down to um, the uh, superficial dermal, very rarely down to the deep dermal. So you can usually heal these um, just on an outpatient setting, keep them covered, keep them hydrated, um, and kind of go that way with them. Next is contact burns. So this is uh, talking about the coals we were talking about earlier. So contact burns basically from any hot metals, plastic, glass, hot coals, anything that is hot object. Um, burns are usually limited in extent and how they extend because you don't really get you don't really keep burning and, and spreading out like you do with if you're catch a clothes catch fire or anything. But those areas that you step on, grab anything like that is usually going to be extremely deep. Um, so all, often these will go all the way to full thickness burns. Um, victims uh, are often involved in industrial accidents, um, welders, uh, glass blowers, that sort of thing, anybody working with very hot materials. Um, and um, usually uh, in these settings, uh, they also have uh, other issues because something has fallen on them. Um, usually you have crush injuries, that sort of thing. I uh, once treated a guy who had um, been uh, welding a uh, couple like really heavy industrial duty uh, metal plates uh, together um, and uh, and the plate was heated extremely hot. The, the uh, scaffolding that was holding him fell and fell onto his leg, crushed his leg um, and he couldn't get out from under it. It burned, um, one, he just had, um, that, uh, protective leather apron and jeans on. So it burned straight through that also burned through steel toe boots, uh, totally took away, uh, had a full thickness burn, um, all the way down to his tendons on top of his foot. It was bad. So usually with, um, the industrial, uh, industries, uh, you do have these contact burns that are extremely, extremely bad because you have, um, something that is holding, uh, contact on because something's fallen on them. Um, or they, these objects have been heated so hot that, um, they cause extreme injury just with the slightest touch. 
Um, Increased use of wood burning stoves um, uh, is increasing the amount of toddlers getting burned each year. I don't know how many of you guys follow like tiny house, fan life movement, that sort of thing. Everyone, the new fad is putting in more wood burning stoves into your setup to kind of keep you warm during the winter. Um, but uh, what these are usually small spaces, uh, and a lot of these people have kids as well. Um, so not just kids, but also the individuals themselves, when they're in small spaces, they are super bound to go up, like brush up against the wood burning stove, the, the flue pipe and everything, and, and really cause intense contact burns. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, and usually uh, with the kids, uh, they trip, fall, and their hands uh, outreach, and they hit against the stove or hit against the hot, hot objects that cause uh, deep burns on the palms. So that's that's a super common injury. Um, kids aren't the lightest on their feet, and when they trip and fall and try to catch themselves, if they catch themselves on something hot, um, they're going to have burns. Um, and um, in unconscious persons uh, dealing with uh, any kind of Multis, uh, multi materials and that uh, sort of stuff. So kind of what I was talking with the guy earlier, um, heating that metal all the way hot to the point where it was turning red and that sort of stuff, it falling on him, unable to get out, or someone gets uh, uh, hits their head going down and uh, passes out and with some kind of uh, burning contact on them. These can go all the way down to uh, fourth degree burns, which you're getting muscle, tendon, bone involvement. Um, these are extremely hard to heal. Um, in wilderness setting, um, uh, I wish I want to throw out there because I really want this to kind of work for uh, rural wilderness in individuals as well. Um, the most common contact burn is hot coals, uh, which are often as hot as 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So super hot. This is almost twice as hot as the tar we were talking about from the pot earlier that can burn you within a second. So uh, basically on contact, you're getting uh, uh, deep, deep, full thickness burns. Um, if you're lucky, the coals have been... Um, uh, are, are, have been dying for a while or were just starting to burn and haven't kind of brought uh, that full heat uh, into it and you can get away with uh, uh, some less severe burns. But uh, if you're wearing a strap on sandals uh, and a hot coal gets stuck in your sandal, that can keep contact longer onto your foot. Um, and then uh, people who are drunk uh, may not uh, instantly realize that they have uh, stepped on a hot coal uh, and, and remove their foot so they can have deeper uh, burns and that sort of thing. So just kind of kind of things to uh, keep in mind when you're you're seeing these uh, individuals. Um, and then often when there are campers and that sort of thing who have uh, backpacked into areas uh, and are burn themselves and are having a backpack out there, if they burn their foot, uh, then they're having to walk on that foot the entire way. So you may have to deal with infection and that sort of stuff later on, too. Just uh, other considerations to have. All right. Chemical burns. Nasty stuff. Um, we talked earlier about... Um, uh, it's, uh, most of the burns we're talking about are, are injuries that happen at uh, time of incidents. Chemical burns often ha uh, happen um, even after the incident if you don't properly uh, cleanse the area that the chemical was in contact with. Uh, they keep reacting, they keep burning, they keep causing damage. Um, usually caused by strong acids or alkalis, which are uh, a ton of the cleaners we use uh, just in our um, uh, household, we have these kind of cleaners in it, but not to the strength that we do in industrial areas. So anybody working in medical facilities, anybody working um, with within areas basically that you have to re use really strong chemicals to clean, um, these are going to kind of kind of be those uh, kind of burns. Anybody working in a lab, you're working with the the straight distilled stuff, so hydrochloric acid, that sort of stuff. You're using a, very strong concentrations for other things, so um, those can cause uh, extremely severe chemical burns. So. Um, Contrasting them to thermal burns, uh, chemical burns cause progressive damage until the chemicals are either inactivated by uh, reacting. So all the chemical has reacted with uh, the substance within your uh, skin and uh, now everything has kind of uh, gotten to an inert phase or you have flushed the crap out of these um, wounds with water. Um, so um, basically to neutralize uh, chemical wounds, you don't try and find something to um, neutralize it. So you don't like, oh, this is acid. We have to get a base and, and try and neutralize this. No, you throw water on it and you keep throwing water on it and you keep throwing water on it. So you keep flushing um, for 20 plus minutes and you just keep going at it um, and until basically um, 
the person says they don't really uh, feel it burning down anymore. Um, usually it's going to hurt, um, especially at first um, when you're flushing this. But um, uh, these individuals, once you've flushed out most of the chemical, uh, will say that they are finding, you know, it's it's feeling more relieved um, instead of feeling like it's worsening. Uh, but again, it's, it's not going to feel good when you first do it, because some of those areas you still if it hasn't uh, reached the deep partial thickness in, in any of those areas, then you're still going to have intact nerve endings. and it's going to hurt like a mother. Um, so um, I kind of got off track there for a second. But um, uh, individual circumstances vary. Acid burns. Uh, uh, maybe more uh, self-limited than uh, alka alkali burns are, because usually um, acids are used. Um, uh, uh, acids, you know, tan the skin, and that's how leather tanning is is completed. Uh, it creates uh, an impermeable bar impermeable bear barrier. Oh my gosh, I cannot talk today. That limits further pen penetration of the acid into the further. Um, dermal layer. So basically what you're doing is the acid is burning, 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 but eventually it creates its own wall to keep it from uh, going forward because it's tanned the skin. It's created a barrier so it can't keep going down. So once you flush that uh, acid out of the area, you're good. Alkalize uh, combined with uh, cutaneous lipids and saponify the skin um, until you neutralize them or flush them out. Uh, so basically, once it's burned, um, it, one, it hits, it combines with those lipids, um, uh, uh, within the skin, um, and then uh, it just basically keeps going down uh, until it's all been uh, used up. It's all com it's all gone under that uh, saponification reaction, or you flushed it out. So there, it doesn't form a barrier, uh, so it just kind of keeps digging. Uh, so that's why acids are tend to be self-limited. Alkalis just keep going until there's no more substance left, so they can be much deeper burns. Um, Full thickness chemical burns um, usually appear deceptively superficial, uh, maybe mildish brown on the surface uh, because of the discoloration, the tanning of the skin, especially with the acids. Um, and again, it can form pockets and holes. Uh, if you take a look at that picture on the right, uh, you see that it wasn't one big circumscribed area of wound. It was a bunch of pocketed areas. So pockets can be deeper in one area and, and lighter in the other and that sort of thing. So they can, these need to be, you know, carefully, um, monitored, carefully observed, and you really need to kind of delve into it and see what's going to work best. These kind of wounds you really want to consider, um, uh, you want to consider outside counsel to, on how to treat them, uh, possibly sending them to a specialist uh, burn care facility for skin grafting, that sort of thing, especially if it's anywhere involving the hands, face, uh, knee joints, that sort of thing. If you maybe have a chemical burn on a upper arm or something away from the joint, um, that uh, invariably looks to be only partial thickness, uh, you can try kind of uh, dealing with it at home. Um, but uh, unlike other kind of burns, um, chemical burns often have a lot of uh, neuralgia later on because you had some areas that um, had nerves burned away, some areas that didn't, and then when you get that skin contracture and you get that healing over, um, a lot of the scar tissue can cause irritation, you can have neuralgia later on. So uh, chemical burns are nasty uh, pieces of work and you really wanna be careful how you're dealing with these. As a first responder or uh, someone in the emergency department, your goal is to flush and flush and flush, basically get every piece of chemical out of there so you can uh, stop um, the damage in the reaction. And this is basically what I just said. Um, yeah, again, you flush, flush, um, try and get uh, it copi all the chemicals copiously removed. Um, washing five to 10 minutes under a stream of running water uh, may limit the overall severity of the burn, depending how quickly you get in there. Um, I said 20 minutes. I'm just telling you to keep going for good measure, um, especially if the person is stable uh, and you're able to, to keep flushing, especially if there's any smaller pockets where chemicals can still be reacting. You want to make sure to get all of it out. Uh, and this stream of water, you want um, a, you don't want it to be trickling water. You don't want it to be stagnant water. You want it to be a, a very good flow. So uh, a sink running on full tap, um, flushing the water, because it's that pressure with the water that's going to flush it out of all those small spaces. It's the pressure you want. Um, you don't want to, uh, even if it is going to hurt, but you want to make sure they're, even if you have to help hold them under it, uh, tell them grit their teeth, look away, and you hold their hand under it or whatever body parts burned. Um, and again, you're not trying to look for neutralizing agents, even in the emergency department, you're just trying to flush.
since chemical burns are uh, kind of a little different, I wanted to give you a few examples of very common chemical burns you might see. Um, first being hydrofluoric acid, super common as a cleaning agent. Uh, again, we talked about acid burns causing tanning, and so usually they're self-limiting because they ca eventually cause a barrier to form from them going deeper down. Um, but uh, it also depends on the concentration, how deep of an invasion you're going to get, the tissue destruction, and the amount of pain. Uh, greater than 50% uh, concentration, so this is going to be mostly those heavy industrial cleaners um, and stuff used in laboratories, um, going to cause immediate tissue destruction, severe pain, uh, and it's going to keep burning. 20 to 50% concentration um, is going to create a burn apparently within a couple hours of exposure. So if you have a really strong uh, cleaner, you throw it on your hand or arm or whatever, you notice, hey, it doesn't really hurt or anything. I guess I'm fine. No, you're not fine. Go wash, scrub, flush. Get, get it off your arm as much as possible because it's the amount um, that you're exposed to which is later on gonna kinda show you how deep it penetrated and how much of a burn it's causing. Um, it usually becomes within, apparent within several hours. Uh, these causing more of your um, uh, partial thickness burns uh, and such. Uh, less than 20%, um, uh, kinda getting from high industrial, uh, janitorial, and uh, regular cleaners, maybe not so much household cleaners, but still, still quite, uh, quite strong. Uh, if you have a strong health cold cleaner, you could could have something uh, within that concentration. Usually it takes about 24 hours to become apparent. So basically waking up the next day, your arm's super red. You could have blistering, that sort of thing. Again, if you throw, use gloves when you use cleaners. If you get any on your skin, wash it off underwater, okay? Um, now with uh, hydrofluoric acid, these strong concentrations... Uh, you can sometimes see uh, systemic uh, reactions like hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, um, resulting in QT pro prolongation. For normal individuals, it won't cause much problem. Individuals with cardiac issues will cause a problem. And um, when you have uh, QT prolongation caused uh, by uh, uh, chemical absorption from the hydrochloric acid, you have enough concentration or ex enough exposure for it to get in systemically. It's very hard to reverse. So individuals with that kind of history, hey, a day or so ago, I had a really bad chemical burn, came in, got treated, everything's fine. Now I'm having funny chest feelings. You uh, hook them up to the monitor and showing Q t t prolongation. You admit them because um, they are very resistant uh, to treatment because they have that uh, chemical within their system. Um, so they do need to be admitted. They do need to be monitored. You do need to be careful. Um, not super common, um, but it is just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Hey, chemical burn came up with chest pain later. Something's going on. Let's admit. Um, uh, topical calcium gluconate gel blech, is um, basically gluconate uh, mixed with uh, water soluble uh, lubricant. You can apply it to these um, chemical hydrofluoric acid chemical burns for six times a day for three or four days. Um, and uh, basically what it's doing is trying to help uh, inactivate any other lingering uh, chemical pieces and also help uh, promote healing. Um, Pain relief with this approach, usually flushing uh, immensely and then using the calcium gluconate um, is usually quite rapid. Um, return to pain is also often a sign to repeat the dressing change. Um, so uh, basically all of the components within the gluconate gel is, have been um, uh, uh, rendered inert and you need to change it and uh, uh, use a new uh, topical dressing. Another common uh, chemical burn type is phosphorus, um, found in both military and uh, civilian uh, settings. So it's an incendiary agent used in hand grenades, artillery shells, fireworks, fertilizers, and any homemade explosives. Uh, the fireworks and fertilizers is more what you're probably going to see with it, especially in summer months. Um, but if you are around a military base or anything like that, this is something just to kind of have in your back pocket to know. Um, White phosphorus, which you uh, may be aware is used more in military campaigns, that sort of thing, um, is uh, usually presence of, uh, usually ignites in the presence of air and um, burns until the entire agent is oxidized and the oxygen source is removed. So usually this is, um, this is a military setting. So if there's suddenly exp an explosion at the local military base or something, you're getting a lot of patients, that sort of thing. That's, that might be what, what you're dealing with. Um, doubtful you're going to see it uh, in any other setting unless you're doing uh, volunteer work over in a, a war zone or something like that. But uh, I believe it is also banned uh, to use, but we still do have uh, stockpiles of it. But um, 
treatment uh, for any kind of phosphorus burn. So playing kids playing with fireworks, uh, someone laying down fertilizer and, and not being um, careful, use, touching it with uh, their hands and that sort of stuff. Um, basically, same as the hydrofluoric acid, you're starting with tons of irrigation, um, removing any kind of uh, pieces that you can see, especially fertilized ear pieces. Uh, you, basically, if you can't flush it out, getting in there with some forceps tweezers and um, pulling it out, making sure to really debride that wound and, and washing out clearly. Um, and then moist dressings um, while you're uh, transporting them. If you can't quite see all the particles, uh, using an ultraviolet light uh, can kind of help you see uh, where they're embedded. The, uh, most uh, emergency rooms should have an ultraviolet light just for um, doing uh, uh, looking for uh, corneal abrasions and that sort of thing. Just get the same thing, uh, get the light and uh, sh uh, turn off the lights and shine it over the wound and see if you can uh, identify any uh, remaining pieces, especially if uh, the patient is co uh, complaining of it still burning after you flushed it copiously. Um, yeah. All right. And so the last thing we're going to talk about for uh, the types of burns is electrical burns. Finally, <laughs> lots of types of burns out there. Um, electrical burns are actually uh, thermal burns from high intensity heat. Um, the smaller part of the body which the electricity, electricity passes through, the more uh, intense the heat is and the less it's dissipated. So basically fingers, uh, hands, forearms, toes, um, ears, any, any smaller body parts. Um, are going to be have a lot more damage because uh, it has less uh, dissipation of that current um, in the area. Now, if it's more of the trunk, uh, the back, uh, upper legs, that sort of thing, uh, you're going to have a greater surface area to dissipate uh, that electricity through, and it's going to cause less damage. Um, but then you can have uh, other issues depending on where, where the arc of electricity goes through. Um, it's uh, usually enough to dissipate for the abdomen and such that uh, you don't have uh, extensive di uh, damage to the viscera um, and unless the contact point is on the abdomen or chest. Um, and uh, although cutaneous manifestations may appear limited, a massive underlying tissue destruction often is present. So um, if you take a look to the right, you can see uh, maybe towards the lower palmar area, some of that skin, even though it's kind of white, you see that overlaying skin that doesn't look charred. But underneath, I can tell you that it is super charred, lots of damage, lots of problems. So even uh, in that proximal uh, forearm area where you can see the burn, uh, extending over the tendons and then it suddenly has that margin of stop it pro the damage most likely uh extends um uh, uh several inches upward under that uh seemingly normal skin so um make sure you're doing an extremely thorough um, evaluation and you're debriding all the way back until you find normal healthy tissue in all uh, marginal areas so uh, arc burns, so an arc of electricity uh, usually uh, occurs when you have uh, positive and negative charges that suddenly have a bridge in between them um, and usually takes the most direct path uh, rather uh, than one of least resistance. So it's not so much the resistance, hey, I'm more conductive than whatever material. It's going to take uh, the quickest path uh, to get from point A, point B. Um, so basically uh, consider your... Uh, in front of a big battery, you have a positive and a negative terminal. You grab onto the positive with the left arm, grab on the positive with the right arm. The quickest uh, arc for that to form it, from positive to negative is to go all the way up that left arm across the chest and down the right arm. So it's going to take the path uh, that is quickest to, to get to where it wants to go. Um, they're usually deep, destructive wounds. Um, and um, uh, this is because they are extremely high in temperature. Um, Usually uh, they occur at joints that are in close uh, opposition to uh, whatever um, electrical source you're at the time. So say you're standing to the side of, um, uh, of a big bunch of wiring, you suddenly an arc occurs and it reaches out towards your elbow. It's going to hit your elbow, but then arc back into the circuit uh, because it doesn't want to go a uh, large length of ways, even though maybe the resistance of your body is a little bit more conductive, a little bit less resistance. And so... Uh, than whatever material they're using that, you know, hey, maybe it wants to uh, go to me because I'm less resistant. No, it's going to take uh, whatever is the path, uh, shortest path. Um, just kind of giving you an idea. I'm not going to go through a physics lesson here because even I uh, find this stuff a little little difficult to, to interpret. But basically know that uh, these arcs of energy um, 
go try to stay localized and they cause deep, deep tissue destruction because of their high intensity of heat. Um, Electrical burns cause a particular set of other injuries in, in addition to the actual burn, actual local destruction. Um, and that is because uh, um, they cause uh, muscle contractions that often cause fractures. Uh, if it's anywhere on the torso, any arc that goes through the torso uh, has the ability to go through the spinal column. So you can get a fracture uh, if it goes um to different musculature in the back, it can cause fracture of lumbar vertebrae. If it's in the arm, it can uh, cause sudden fracture of the humerus femur. Just depend, wherever it is, that sudden, harsh, extremely harsh muscle contracture going beyond human limit, limits can cause uh, other kind of damage or injury. So it's something to be aware of. Then you have neurological injury. So uh, we have the initial uh, destruction of tissue caused by the high heat. We have the bone breakage, muscle rip ripping uh, from uh, the uh, sudden harsh muscle contracture. And then we have neurological damage. Um, the most obvious you might be thinking of is cardiac damage, especially with any kind of uh, electrical arcs that go through the torso, especially the chest. Um, and uh, electrical cardiac damage may have symptoms similar to those of my myocardial contusion or infarction. Um, and it can also cause the conduction system within the heart to be deranged. So basically causing um, fibrillation, causing um, sudden um, uh, asystole, that sort of stuff. Um, there can even be an actual rupture uh, of the heart wall or papillary muscle if the arc goes through um, the visceral tissues. And it can lead to sudden valvular incompetence, uh, refractory uh, cardiac failure, or um, exsanguination. Um, household current is uh, generally at 110 volts here in the U.S. and generally doesn't do uh, damage um, or induce uh, ventricular fibrillation, generally. Again, not saying it can't. Uh, alternating current uh, is much more likely to cause uh, fibrillation uh, than direct current is. Um, and, um, but even if it is just a household, hey, I was wiring a light, I got shocked, I am here. Um, you do a full, thorough uh, neurological and cardiac, uh, cardiac evaluation of these individuals because you don't want to miss something. Usually, if you're going to have um, some kind of derangement of the uh, uh, cardiac conduction system causing fibrillation or something else, it's going to happen at the time of the shock. It's not going to happen later on. Um, it's not something that uh, you have to kind of be super on the lookout for. It's super rare for you to have a uh, cardiac arrhythmia, arrhythmia pre uh, present later on when they presented normal at first, um, just so you're aware. Um, but uh, after cardiac issues, uh, something you really should think about is neurologic issues, um, especially in the periphery. Um, so electricity uh, does a ton of damage uh, to the um, uh, neurologic system. So um, if it's an arc that is somewhere close to the head, uh, severe brain damage can occur. Uh, if it's an arc that passes anywhere in the torso, the body, spinal cord damage can occur. Um, so you can have hemiplegia, that sort of stuff. It's particularly um, uh, nasty to myelin-producing cells, so the myelin that coats uh, um, uh, nerves uh, and helps uh, nerve pr um, uh, signal propagation. Um, Basically, you can uh, get devastating effects like transverse myelitis, uh, even days to weeks after the injury. So what it does is it causes initial injury to those myelin-producing cells, and when the existing myelin on the, the nerves uh, gets old, wears off, and uh, that's when you have conduction stopping. That's when you can develop, develop these issues. So in, anybody with uh, the, you know, a hist history of you know a strong, strong electric shock happening towards uh, the torso, head. Um, Basically anywhere, uh, you need to do a follow up um, a couple of weeks later. Make sure they don't have any neurological inju injury progressing um, uh, that wasn't apparent uh, at the time uh, of the incident, um, because they conduction will remain normal until that uh, existing myelin gets old and, and sloughs off of, of the nerves. Um, peripheral nerves are usually the most commonly damaged and um, may demonstrate severe permanent uh, functional impairment. Um, depending on how bad the damage is and, you know, the nerve endings being um, 
um, if it's maybe just tor very much towards the periphery and wasn't uh, an intense amount of damage, you may have the capacity to eventually, if it, it was if it was damaged directly to the nerve, capacity to grow that nerve back. If it was direct, uh, if it was damaged to the uh, myelin-producing cells, um, Schwann cells, um, then you um, may have uh, issues. Uh, later on, and that are permanent. Uh, you may never get that conductive uh, capability back. Um, another thing uh, to uh, be aware of is to be uh, checking um, urine on um, severe electrical burn victims. So you want to check urine for myoglobinal, myoglobin urea. <laughs> I can't say that word either. Um, it's frequent accompaniment accompaniment of uh, severe electrical burns. Um, basically, disruption of muscle cells releases cell fragments and myoglobin into the circulation to be filtered by the kidneys. If um, these individuals uh, start showing uh, myoglobinuria um, and you don't treat it, um, it could lead to renal failure because uh, remember, myoglobin is um, very, very toxic to kidney, especially if you have uh, extremely um, uh, if you have a patient who had an electrical injury and they also have muscle or uh, bone fractures or, or something like that, uh, that tells you, hey, they had extremely strong muscular contraction that caused this fracture or caused um, this muscle bed to rip or something like that. If you have uh, injury to that muscle at the time of um, of uh, the incident, uh, you can later uh, develop uh, that myoglobin being released into the, the bloodstream, being filtered by the kidneys, causing renal failure. So be very, very careful with these individuals that you don't also uh, let their kidneys go bad afterwards. So uh, scene treatment for electrical burns is um, a little different. Um, basically, if you suspect that someone has been shocked um, you want to uh, make sure the victim is no longer in contact with the source of electricity. This is especially true for like downed power pole uh, lines and that sort of thing. Something around you that is uh, still in contact. It's not going to it doesn't mean it's going to be sparking. Um, it may look totally benign until you uh, touch the patient or you touch the area they're in. If they're a bit big puddle of water with um, uh, some kind of electrical line down in it. Um, that that you can be uh, a second victim. You do not want to be a second victim. So you really need to make sure um, you are uh, assessing the scene, making sure everything's safe before you approach the victim. Um, if you do notice they are still touching a wire, they are still um, they are still in a puddle that is connected to electricity. Whatever, you need to make sure that. Uh, you're safe. You need to make sure that the power can be turned off, that the current can be cut. You need to exercise every caution. Protect yourself before you try and help a patient. Okay. Um, once the victim has been removed from the source of current, um, basically you go through your uh, march protocol. Uh, so you check for airway, breathing, uh, any massive hemorrhaging, uh, circulation, and uh, go from there. Uh, do a full assessment. Uh, again, respiration is, is your, your key thing. If they're not breathing, that's, that's what you're going after first. If they don't have a pulse, that's what you're going after. Um, and then after you secured airway, breathing, they have a circulation, they have a pulse, then you can start checking uh, them over for other injuries. Massive hemorrhage, especially with those uh, fractures, um, with those uh, severe uh, um, electrical arcs that can cause, that contracture can cause fractures, humerus, uh, anything like that. If you have... Um, if you have a displaced fracture, you need to replace it, uh, or sorry, you need to reduce it. Um, so basically with uh, legs, with uh, arms, um, if you if the leg is contorted a certain way um, and you, you notice they have a very obvious break, you do need to uh, reduce that in the field so they don't keep uh, bleeding internally. Just by uh, reducing those uh, two edges of bone together um, can uh, help reduce the, those complications, uh, especially later on if uh, they don't want to lose the limb. Um, and then, uh, you want to check them over for any other injuries, making sure they don't have any head contusions, that sort of thing. Um, and then you kind of just, uh, go over, um, your, your, your general evaluation. Um, you do want to do a cardiac evaluation in the field, um, if you, uh, suspect any kind of, uh, electrical injury. So you, so you want to hook them up to an AED. You want to make sure that they don't, aren't in ventricular fibrillation or have some kind of arrhythmia that you need to be monitoring, 
um, very closely as you transport them to the appropriate facility. Uh, if they need com- uh, cardiopulmonary res- resuscitation, um, uh, go ahead and uh, start instituting that while you're transferring them to the, uh, to the facility. Um, if um, pulses are pre- present, but the victim is apneic, uh, respiratory resuscitation alone might be uh, life-saving. So that's why we say uh, go through uh, the protocol appropriately um, and make sure you secure their airway. Um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation should continue until the cardiac monitor can be obtained. So hooking up to the AD and uh, determining what their current status is. Um, and again, most commonly, if they're going to have a, a cardiac issue uh, secondary to um, the electric shock, it's either going to be fibrillation or asystole. So um, once you have established airway, pulses return, uh, you've carefully searched for any other injuries, um, then you can uh, start worrying about transferring them. Um, do note that electric, uh, electrocuted victims often fall from heights and so often have head or neck injuries. So if you've already secured everything else, uh, go ahead and put them in a neck brace, put them on a backboard before you uh, start transferring them uh, just in case, especially if they are um, not awake and not able to answer your questions and help you do a proper evaluation. Be very careful of how you move them. Uh, so anybody like putting up Christmas lights to working on phone lines to uh, doing something on the roof, you know, you just want to really make sure that you're not exasperating some other issue on top of everything else. All right, and I think we went over everything else. So let's move on. All right, so I promised you I would talk about uh, how to cool wounds, and uh, burn wounds and that sort of thing. So here's some first aid tips for you at home in general. And then also if you're first on scene and stuff uh, before you're thinking about transferring them over uh, to any other facility, uh, what to kind of do there in the moment. So uh, let's first talk about cold application. Uh, smaller burns, particularly scalds that are, again, within just that uh epidermal layer uh, can be treated with immediate application of cool water, not super cold, not ice water, never ice water, cool water in the hope of limiting the extent of the injury. Okay. Um, the application of cold water is a little controversial still, but immediately uh, cooling the injury does decrease the pain uh, and can possibly uh, decrease the thromboxane pr- uh, production, which we'll kind of get into later, um, but which can kind of uh, decrease uh, further um, uh, further injury from uh, coagulative uh, necrosis and that sort of stuff. Uh, and again, don't ever use uh, ice water except maybe on the smallest, smallest of burns. Um, using ice on a larger burn generally uh, uh, can easily induce systemic uh, hypothermia and associated uh, cutaneous vasoconstriction can lead to more thermal damage. Uh, basically, you get the coagulation necrosis on top of causing uh, uh, vasoconstriction because you're putting that ice water on uh, and you're getting complete stoppage of blood flow to that burn wound. And what you need is uh, you need good blood flow to to the burn wound, as we've talked earlier, to bring in those healing factors, call the neutrophils, macrophages, basically bring in the army to start doing the work of clearing the wreckage and, and start the healing. Um, ice uh, does not do well. And again, with larger wounds, um, you're losing a lot of that um, that uh, dermal protection um, for insulation uh, and keeping uh, one's core body temperature um, uh, stable. So if you're icing over a large uh, a large wound uh, like that, you could be causing uh, full systemic hypothermia. So you want to be careful. That's generally why we say stay, stay away from ice, uh, not because of any other uh, huge issues, but um, freezing injury is just as bad as. Um, as the burn injury, which we'll go over in our next lecture. But yeah, you don't want to, even with those small ones, I, I would say kind of stay away from ice cubes or anything like that because you don't want to freeze the area right after burning it. Um, you can have a whole another slew of uh, injury uh, insults. Um, talking about swelling, um, so if you have had a burn to an extremity, uh, any constricting clothing, jewelry, anything like that needs to be moved because you're most likely going to start a uh, swelling response and it usually starts almost immediately, uh, especially with those superficial um, uh, par- uh, partial thickness burns, um, because uh, you have burned far enough down to cause an intense inflammatory reaction response, but not not far about, down enough to cause an eschar or anything like that that is going to uh, inhibit uh, any of those factors uh, from um, flowing in. You're not causing any of the coagulant necrosis or anything like that so deep down that you've uh, impeded blood flow. Um, but because you're bringing all those fa- these factors in, again, again, we talked earlier, uh, the uh, localized uh, reaction 
um, for burns is that capillary permeability increasing. So you have a lot of the protein and fluid uh, depositing into the interstitial tissues around the burn, um, which can cause it to swell. And then if you have large burns, then you can get the full systemic response where you're swelling everywhere because uh, you're getting that cap capillary permeability everywhere. So, um, yeah, anything that is constrictive, ring, wedding rings, um, bracelets, watches, um, uh, any really tight fitting clothing you want to you want to be removing from the patient so they, they don't have issues with swelling later on and you have to try and cut things off. Not fun. All right, let's get into some more of uh, burn first aid. So burns less than 5% total body surface area, so small burns, uh, burns that don't include face, hands, feet, uh, uh, genitals, um, or have a circumfer circumferential, you know, uh, burn. Um, We'll talk kind of a little bit later in the escar debridement and stuff why you really don't want those circumfer circumferential burns, um, but basically small small burns that are very local and and you think you can um, kind of treat uh, uh, on scene can you can just do it on scene have them uh, uh, be at home follow up with their family doc the next day or day after I tell them how to take care of it and that sort of stuff. Um, Except for uh, the very uh, shallow burn that heals within a few days, most burns should be uh, seen by a physician within three to five days, okay? So they do want to follow up. You do, you, yeah, a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm fine and that sort of thing. Um, you do want to kind of make sure it's healing appropriately. There's no issues. Patients don't really know what to look for. Um, so you'd need to make sure that they know, hey, you really should just at least go get this looked at um, by your family doc, okay? Uh, even if, if they don't have a family doc, tell them, hey, just prop in urgent care, tell them kind of what's been going on, what you've been using for it and stuff and get any further advice. Um, but what you can do and what they can do uh, on scene uh, is wash it thoroughly with plain soap and water. You don't have to use any kind of special soap, just using Dawn uh, dish soap um, and then um, uh, patting uh, with a clean, dry towel, patting it dry. Um the water should be uh, suitable water for drinking. It doesn't have to be sterile. It doesn't have to be bottled. Um, we're not really worried too much about infection at this point. Um, it just needs to be uh, clean and um, be able to really cool uh, cool the injury but not freeze it. Okay, that's kind of what we're generally thinking of. Any uh, obviously dead skin uh, should be peeled off which can be a bit painful, um, especially with the more superficial burns. When you're getting into the deep partial thickness and stuff, you're losing a lot of those free nerve endings, so it doesn't hurt as much. But when it's more superficial, um, it can hurt quite a lot. Um, but you should go ahead and peel back that dead skin. Don't, like, try and rip it off. What you do is you get a pair of... Uh, uh, if you're in your house, you get um, a pair of tweezers and a, a small pair of scissors, and uh, you do it that way. If you uh, have a medical kit with you, um, you'll use um, a pair of AdSense and a small pair of scissors as well. Um, basically, what you do is you lift up the, the edge of skin. We're getting into debridement territory here, but uh, you lift up the edge of skin that's kind of free, um, wh whether it's uh, from a popped blister where, or it's just, uh, you know, the area was burned uh, sufficiently enough just for that upper layer of skin to be peeled off. You peel it uh, back until you get to the edge where it is uh, adhered. Um, back uh, down to the uh, dermis, and then you cut around it. And you do that for the entire circum uh, circumference. So you're not trying to peel back where it's from where it's um, adhered. You're just pulling up uh, what is free and loose and, and cutting that excess off. Uh, reason being, um, that can be a fomite for uh, bacterial growth. That can cause uh, infectious problems. So you do want to uh, do you do want to remove all of that. And then you have a nice open area for um, uh, for epithelialization to occur, okay? Um, large, um, thin, uh, fluid-filled blisters, so so fairly fairly big blisters, greater than an inch, um, should be drained and the dead skin uh, trimmed to prevent uh, the infection, like we were saying. You don't want to let it adhere back down and, and, and you know, kind of leave that, uh, what's, what's it called? Um, the uh, natural, basically natural bandage, uh, that you talk about with, uh, blisters outside of burns. Uh, you want to, uh, basically incise, let it drain, and then cut away the dead skin tissue. Okay. You don't want, uh, bacteria to be able to seed that area. Um, deep burns from a flame are usually firm, leathery, 
um, and usually don't blister, but don't require immediate debridement. So if the patient doesn't want to go in the ambulance or anything like that, you can tell them, okay, you need to go to the emergency room uh, within the next couple hours and uh, have them do uh, an assessment and debridement and everything to do this properly. And then they can uh, properly dress it and, and that sort of thing. Okay. So after you have uh, removed uh, that area of uh, uh, dead skin, uh, what do you put on it? Well, um, if you have a really nice <laughs> med kit or you have uh, bought stuff for preventative measures for smaller burns and stuff in the past, uh, the basically what you, the golden standard is, right now is uh, silver sulfadiazine cream. Uh, usually most of the burn care stuff in Walmart, over-the-counter, that sort of thing, contains sulfadiazine. Um, you can also use uh, bacitracin or neosporin. Um, do note, bacitracin and neosporin both are notorious for causing um, causing uh, a rash or some kind of uh, inflammation in the area. It uh, doesn't happen in everyone, but it happens in enough people that most medical providers don't necessarily love using it. Um, if the if the person has gone to their doc uh, and for some reason they don't like this uh, sulfadizing cream, they have a sulfa allergy, something like that, they don't like how it smells or feels or anything, um, go ahead and prescribe them um, uh, mupirocin, uh, that has a much, much less likely uh, chance of causing any kind of skin ir irritation. Um, really, what, uh, what you want, um, in addition to that uh, antibiotic portion, if they're doing the mupirocin or something, you want to put a little Vaseline on top of it too, because uh, once you've burned uh, enough of that epithelial layer down, you've lost your, your barrier, barrier, that uh, area will start to uh, desiccate, it'll start to dry out. Um, and it's the Vaseline component in those creams and stuff that you really want to keep that um, that area uh, moist and intact. Um, keeping it moist is going to keep free flowing blood through those capillaries. It's also going to um, uh, kind of help prevent any scab formation or anything that's going to uh, prevent more uh, better epithelialization. Um, the sulfadiazine and the antibiotic creams are um, kind of helping. Uh, uh, with uh, preventing uh, antibacter uh, bacterial uh, invasion too. You don't need to use systemic antibiotics with burn victims, but yeah, um, you do need to use those topicals. Okay, then after you've uh, put that on, the wound can be wrapped in dry, clean gauze. Um, doesn't need to be sterile, just needs to be clean. Um, and you can just do a, a very simple dressing, very simple loose dressing. You don't, it doesn't have to be super tight or, or su super care careful with. Um, in between, so if the patient isn't going to go to the hospital or anything like that, it's a, it's a deep enough wound that they need to care with it for it for a couple of weeks. If it's more in that superficial uh, partial thickness burn area. Um, have them wash the burn um, with water and some light soap daily, and then reapply the sulfadizing cream and rewrap it lightly uh, with the gauze. So that'll that'll kind of help. Uh, we'll talk a little later of stuff you can do. Um, to, oh, we'll talk about it in just a minute, uh, to prevent how frequently you need to change. But um, uh, so patients uh, sometimes prefer non-adherent dressings um, uh, like um, Telfa or Adaptic, um, basically greasy gauze, because you don't want gauze that has a lot of um, What's the word? It's a very loose knit gauze that has a lot of porous uh, components to it because that can often get stuck in the wound when they're doing changes. And then if you have those more superficial burns, you're having all those intact nerve endings. It's not going to feel good. It's going to it's going to hurt quite a bit. Um, and basically, the same effect can be achieved if you soak um, uh, plain gauze with a lot of water. Um, and uh, that appears stuck to the wound before you remove it. So this is a, like a dry piece of gauze that was porous that you put on. Have them uh, stick their hand under the faucet for a couple of minutes. Let that it wet um, before they remove it, and then they won't get any of the catching or anything when they're pulling off, and it won't hurt um, so much. Um, and like I was, I was saying earlier, there are other types of dressing that you don't have to change out daily. Um, hydrogels, silver coated dressings, uh, silicone gel sheets, calcium alginate. Um, they're all designed to decrease the amount of dressing changes you need. Some go from a couple of days, some go to up to a week. They're available, but they're not necessarily, they're not necessarily, sorry, not necessarily, dang it. <laughs> and um, they uh, probably won't be covered by insurance because, um, it's, it's kind of more of a convenience thing, um, but they should be able to find those over the counter as well. Um, 
But yeah, basically, if you want your gold bread and butter, what to do for a burn, um, wash it, soap and water, throw sulfidizing cream on it, wrap it lightly with gauze, and wash and change the dressing every day. Yep, that's basically it. And this is just kind of continuing what I was just saying. Um, basically, uh, the dressings, just make sure they're loose, light. Uh, they can cover the burn area, not leaving any exposed uh, burn skin to air currents. This is more for a pain factor because blowing air on the, directly on that, uh, those superficial burns hurts. Um, and you also want to keep them moist. Uh, so um, basically, if you're a really dry environment, um, you, you really want to make sure to change that dressing often enough that you're keeping that more moist to, to uh, help uh, with healing. Uh, you don't want the dressing um, uh, keeping the patient from flexing any joints. Um, again, movement, especially with any kind of burn over a joint, um, early movement, constant movement is what's going to keep their mobility, uh, keeping a hypertrophic scarring and stuff. With very superficial wounds, this isn't something you have to worry about too much, um, but also very tight uh, um bandages can kind of uh hurt it cause a little bit more pain too so you just want to keep it all loose and stuff but yeah everything else we've pretty much talked about all right and then once a wound has epithelialized or nearly epithelialized um you can kind of help with any kind of scar formation or anything like that using uh, moisturizing lotions uh aiding you want to keep those wounds hydrated, desiccation leads to worsening scars. Um, you can use vitamin E, aloe, um, oat beta glucan, all often used for their anti-inflammatory and soothing properties um, during healing. Um, Melaleuca is topical antibacterial and antifungal tea tree oil that um, uh, is kind of comes out of Australia. It's one of the main ingredients of burn aid. Um, it's uh, a, a popular cream with people for superficial uh, partial thickness burn injuries. Um, you do get that antibacterial um, property. You're not really worried about fungal issues too much, but you know it has that in it. Uh, also has um, a good um, emollient uh, like Vaseline in it that kind of helps. Um, uh, keep things uh, nice and moisturized too. So that's something you can use. It's a, it's going to be a bit more expensive. I mean, sulfidizing cream uh, or um, some eupyrosin will work just fine. All right, let's get into some of the more serious stuff. So let's talk about airway assessment um, at uh, the scene of burn injury. Um, so this is something we're mainly talking about with um, uh, f basically fires, interior fires, where someone has been exposed to flames and smoke and stuff in an interior setting. Usually don't get smoke inhalation injury, thermal injury, that sort of stuff um, for uh, individuals uh, who get burned in an ex outdoor setting. Uh, you, know, you can have chemical pneumonitis and that sort of stuff with chemical burns, uh, not as likely unless you're in like more of a laboratory setting or um, you know, you're having chemical pneumonitis from someone cleaning floors and that sort of stuff, which is kind of out of the scope of this uh, context. Uh, and then electrical burns, you're not really going to have any of these uh, smoke inhalation problems. So it's really um, these uh, in these indoor fires that uh, have a lot of flames, have a lot of smoke um, that you really want to pay attention uh, to these victims. Um, so any person rescued from a closed space or involved in a smoky fire should be considered at risk for smoke inhalation injury. Um, so basically, as soon as you get them out, the first thing you're going to do it, after assessing is throw some uh, oxygen on them. Um, if a victim is coughing, you should encourage them to keep doing so. Tell them, OK, keep coughing. If they have any soot or anything down in their trachea or, or lower airways, you want them to cough that up as much as possible. So encourage them to cough. Coughing is good. Cough deep breath of the oxygen. So you want an oxygen mask on them um, uh, and to get them, get them as good as possible. Uh, we'll talk about um, why here in a second, but there's a couple of issues with smoke we, we have to be wary of. Um, if a patient is uh, unconscious once they're gotten out of a burning facility, um, uh, and, personal, and personnel there are trained to insert uh, into tracheal tube, um, you should go ahead and do that and uh, attach it to a source of 100% oxygen. So um, basically, unconscious victim um, should be um, tubed by uh, the uh, EMS services uh, once they arrive, um, just in case there's any issues going on, because the patient's not awake and can tell you if they're having trouble breathing, uh, coughing, anything like that. So um, better safe than sorry, basically. Um, 
uh, if the airway has to be supported by a tight mask, um, the rescuers must be aware of the significant danger of aspiration. So basically, uh, the mask is going to force more air into the, the stomach. If the patient has just recently eaten or drank something, it can cause the stomach to distend and then collapse, causing vomiting. Um, and the mask uh, w will then prevent any expulsion of the fluid, especially if the, uh, the person is unconscious. Uh, the uh, victim can rapidly aspirate the vomitus into the tracheobronchial tree um, and, uh, and basically aspirate and die. Um, so you have to be very, very careful um, with these individuals and, and monitor them. They should not be left unattended. Um, and you, you need to make sure if they start um, at, they start uh, vomiting that you are able to quickly roll them on their side, uh, let them vomit out, remove the mask, and then replace the mask once they, the episode is over. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why smoke uh, inhalation is so bad. So this was actually the really educational part of this, uh, this lecture series for me personally, because I didn't know a lot of this stuff, uh, and it's a little scary. Um, but so a uh, about 500,000 uh, fire victims admitted to hospitals each year. Um, I know this seems like a lot less for how much we treated for actual burns, but this is fires for smoke inhalation and that sort of stuff. Uh, 500,000 fire victims admitted to hospitals each year. Uh, smoke with thermal damage to the respiratory tree may occur in as many as 30%. Okay. That's as many as 150,000 a year with uh, either smoke or thermal damage uh, inhalation injury. Um, the big thing we really want to be worried about is anybody who's coming out of a smoky fire uh, or a fire with that car started on fire, fire there in an enclosed space is carbon monoxide poisoning, um, smoke poisoning, and thermal energy, uh, injury. Those are all three big things. Um, probably the most prevalent that we're thinking of is going to be the carbon uh, monoxide poisoning. Um, so just to recap, carbon monoxide, odorless, colorless, tasteless, can't, you don't even know it's there. If you have an active uh, flame and smoke, you can pretty much rest assured that you have tons of carbon monoxide being kicked out. It has an affinity for hemoglobin that's 200 times more than that of oxygen. So um, your blood cells, if uh, carbon monoxide is in the air that you're breathing in, it's gonna pick up the carbon monoxide instead of the oxygen because it prefers it. Um, the only good flip side of that is it also has an uh, extremely high displacement um, value so it also gets knocked off uh, hemoglobin quite easily um, once the partial pressure of carbon monoxide is taken away. Um, which we'll get to kind of here in a sec. Um, so um, the blood values of carboxyhemoglobin is actually one of the standards we use for evaluating um, smoke inhalation victims uh, at within the ER uh, to know how hypoxic they are and, and you know kind of what their uh, blood levels are, what their risk factor for uh, smoke inhalation damages. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about you know what blood levels mean what, what kind of symptoms are going to present uh, as uh, what symptoms. So uh, for these values, know that about 10% uh, carboxyhemoglobin in the blood usually um, don't have symptoms, but can uh, cause chest pain um, and decreased exercise tolerance. Um, not something that's gonna be super obvious. 20%, um, uh, healthy persons will even start complaining of headaches, nausea, vomiting, uh, loss of manual dexterity, that sort of stuff. So they'll know something is definitely off, something's wrong. Um, these can also, these symptoms can also just kind of be in the back of your mind for thinking about, hey, uh, gas leak, carbon monoxide from the, the um, car in the garage, that sort of thing, uh, for people coming into your daily clinic and stuff, complaining about these issues. So just something to keep in your mind. Um, 30% um, blood concentration of carboxyhemoglobin, uh, usually getting confusion, lethargy, may show uh, decreased ST segments and electrocardiogram. Um, in a fire situation, the uh, confusion and lethargy can le mean the victim loses interest or even the ability to flee from the smoke. Um, they may just sit down and, and not know what to do, and so that can lead to their death. Uh, getting to 40 to 60 percent, the victims usually uh, get more and more lethargic until they collapse into a coma, and above 60 percent is usually fatal. Okay. Um, 
blood levels uh, are really a big part of measuring um, where we're at uh, with uh, properly oxygenating victims here in the ER. So um, basically, as soon as someone gets to the ER, blood gases are drawn if, if they have been uh, suspected of smoke inhalation injury. Um, and then you can also use blood gases uh, subsequently to see how any uh, progressive treatment um, is uh, correcting their values. So the half-life of uh, carboxyhemoglobin in humans uh, breathing just room air is about four to five hours. Uh, if you're breathing 100% oxygen, half-life is reduced to about 45 to 60 minutes. In a hyperbaric oxygen chamber at two PSI, half-life is down to 30 minutes. Um, and a three ATM chamber, 15 to 20 minutes. So there's actually a big uh, controversy uh, about using hyperbaric chambers, which we'll talk about in just a second. But usually what you're gonna be using uh, either at scene or in the ER is a, um, a tight fitting mask with high flow, 100% oxygen. And um, uh, you know, I'm gonna be using that over the next several hours with the patient to try and equilibrate. Um, now, Something to be aware of is if you have any patients with COPD and you're using 100% oxygen, you can decrease their respiratory drive. Um, so doing a thorough history, making sure they're awake and stuff and trying or uh, finding family members to really get a thorough history to make sure you're properly treating them and being very careful um, not to uh, send them into respiratory distress um, by reducing their um respiratory drive by over oxygenating. Um, you want enough oxygen to try and clear the carbon um, monoxide out of their system, but you don't want enough that makes them stop breathing. Okay. About recovery, victims who were not unconscious at the scene or on arrival, who have a normal neuro examination and on admission, almost com uh, recover completely um, without any more treatment beyond 100% oxygen. Um, victims who remain comatose uh, even after uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels have returned to normal, the very poor prognosis, they very often do not wake up. So something to kind of be aware of and something to be talking about with family um, that uh, arrive and are kind of waiting for their, their individual to regain consciousness. Um, there are very many people who uh, are proponents of hyperbaric oxygen treatment for carbon monoxide po uh, poisoning. And again, when you look at um, what we just talked about, uh, two PSI of 100% oxygen in a chamber, um, reducing a half-life to 30 minutes, and then um, three to four PSI, reducing it all the way down to 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, you can get the carbon monoxide out of their system quicker. If the patient is conscious, uh, able to wear the mask of a of high flow oxygen uh, and is is you know doing fairly well. I wouldn't even bother with the the transport to the hyperbaric chamber. If it's someone who's unconscious, very high levels of carbon monoxide, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's 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 much more likely you want to use every every trick in the bag, especially if they're over that 40 uh, to 50 percent range of uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels. But something you really need to be aware of is once they're in the chamber, you're very limited in anything you can do uh, with them. If they have a major burn um, because of they were in a fire, transport to the chamber delay uh, delays definitive care. So you have to do all the re resusc uh, fluid resuscitation and everything on the fly as you're trying to get them into a chamber. Um, and then if there's any complications, including emesis, seizures, uh, eustachian tube occlusion, aspiration, um, agitation, um, uh, any hypotensive uh, events, uh, pneumothorax, cardiac arrhythmias, anything. They're stuck in a chamber and you have to try and yank them out. You don't have immediate access to them. You can't be uh, doing a very, very few chambers have a line that you can do drug administration straight through uh, to the chamber with. So it's usually in an enclosed space that you're going to have to have to yank them out of if anything goes wrong. So it's a lot harder to care for patients in a hyperbaric chamber. You pretty much only want to use it when you really have to. And um, and otherwise, if a patient is doing well with a uh, tight fitting high flow mask, I would just kind of go with that. OK. Okay, so after carbon monoxide, the other thing you want to be thinking of are thermal airway injuries. So uh, the kind of term pulmonary burn is a mis misnomer. Um, true thermal damage of the lower respiratory tract and lung parenchyma is extremely rare. 
uh, unless you have like a live uh, a live steam from a steam engine, boiler room, that sort of thing, or some kind of exploding gases that are inhaled, or kind of what I was uh, talking later outside the scope of this uh, video is, uh, you know, uh, industrial cleaners and stuff being spread out over the floor with mops and that sort of thing, and inhaling that, not wearing a mask, any kind of industrial solvents, that sort of thing, um, inhaling that can cause more, more of that deep. Uh, chemical pneumonitis, but not generally what we see with thermal airway injuries as a result of fire and that sort of thing. The air temperature near the ceiling of a burning room may reach uh, up to a thousand uh, degrees, basically. But usually, one, you're not you're not at the the ceiling of the room. You're usually uh, hunkering down closer to the floor. Um, and air uh, has kind of a, a very low heat carrying capacity, and so most of it is dissipated in the uh, nasopharynx and upper airway. So if you're going to have quote burns uh, in your um, your uh, airway is going to be in that upper airway. So uh, in your nostrils, in your nasopharynx, upper airway, upper trachea, that sort of thing, not deeper into your bronchi, not deeper in, towards your alveoli and stuff. But just having burns in that upper wear, airway can cause serious, serious issues, okay? So patients you want to be on the lookout for this with are victims who have been in explosions, propane, natural gas, gasoline, any of that, having burns on the hands, face, upper torso, are at greater risk for these uh, burns and resultant pharyngeal, pharyngeal edema. So basically what you're doing is a really good scene safety check, um, making sure that uh, any uh, anybody that is at risk for having uh, those uh, thermal inhalation injuries is having a good check of their nostrils, getting a good check of their nasopharynx, seeing if you see any blistering um, uh, or uh, erosions or anything that kind of indicates that they could have a thermal airway in injury. If there is a lot of, you know, a lot of history uh, that kind of suggests that they may have burns in their nasopharynx, um, but you're not really seeing them, um, then maybe um, consider using a bronchoscope and that sort of thing to kind of really you know, delve into it. We'll talk more about that with smoke inhalation injury. Um, but the reason why is any kind of burns, abrasions, that sort of thing, thing in the nasopharynx won't usually is, is superficial, doesn't burn very deep. You don't get full thickness, but it does cause that infl inflammatory reaction causing uh, edema within the airway. And that can close off the airway and cause uh, the victim to suffocate and die. So that's why you want to be very wary of this. Any um, victim that you suspect of these injuries, you may want to consider doing um, uh, an intubation, intubation um, just to be sure that they're not going to lose their airway. Because if they start losing their airway due to edema, you are going to be very hard pressed to get a tube down their throat and not have to perform um, a tracheotomy. Tracheotomy should not be an emergency procedure. It should just it should be planned out if they you think. Uh, an individual is going to need it for long-term care. If you feel like you are even at risk of having to do tracheotomy later, you should intubate prophylactically, okay? Um, and then uh, if the patient is doing well, the edema from uh, these kind of burns uh, within the nasopharynx usually subsides 24 to 72 hours. A test to see if they are able to protect their own airway is to de deflate the cuff at the end of the tube and see if you can hear them breathing around the tube. If you hear airflow going up and down around the tube, then you can consider extubation. Um, if you are not sure um, that they can be properly extubated without uh, having problems. You can do it over a fiber opt optic uh, bronchoscope or a nasogastric tube uh, to allow easy uh, replacement if uh, it's uh, necessary, ne uh, necessary to re reintubate them. Okay? Um, because this is not a pulmonary a parenchyal, parenchyal injury, um, the purpose of intubation is to protect the airway. Just remember that you're protecting future problems from them losing the airway and not having to do emergency procedures um, like a trach, okay? Plan ahead. All right, so the last part of smoke uh, inhalation injury is smoke to toxicity. So nowadays we live in houses that have tons of paint, tons of different chemicals used in our woodwork, um, different uh, types of uh, furniture, uh, bowls, stationery, everything. Everything has so many chemicals in it. Um, and uh, 
So, and there have been about 280 separate toxic products that have been identified just in wood smoke alone. So there are tons of toxicants in the smoke. You're not just dealing with carbon monoxide or thermal injury. You're also dealing with toxic, toxic stuff. Okay. Um, modern uh, petrochemical science has now uh, kind of produced a wealth of plastic materials in homes, automobiles, and everything that when it burns, um, many of the byproducts uh, can be very toxic to the airways uh, and systemically toxic as well when you breathe in enough. Um, and then uh, other byproducts uh, from anything uh, being combustible it, that you often have are oxides of sulfur, nitrogen, aldehydes, um, all of which are, are can cause severe pulmonary uh, irritation, edema, and that sort of stuff. Um, although the chemical mechanisms of injury may be different, um, you, there's kind of a general broadly defined uh, response that individuals have to toxicant damage due to smoke inhalation. Um, so some things all include immediate loss of bronchial epithelial cilia um, and decreased alveolar surfactant, microatelectasis due to that uh, decreased surfactant. Sometimes you can get macroatelectasis. Um, mucosal edema in all your airways, so start getting edema, start getting closing off of those airways. Wheezing, air hunger, very common um, with these individuals by this time. After a few hours after smoke inhalation, tracheal and bronchial uh, epithelia begin to slough off, and you can then have uh, tra uh, hemorrhagic tracheobronchitis develop. So start coughing up blood, start having uh, a lot of issues a couple hours after smoke inhalation. Severe cases you can, uh, with a ton of edema, can lead all the way to acute respiratory distress syndrome, where you have to intubate and the patient is uh, in very dire circumstances. Um, you can also have uh, poisoning of pulmonary alveolar macrophages, which can pro uh, prevent uh, a, a proper chemotaxis to clear out um, any bacteria, any chemicals, that sort of stuff. So uh, macrophage is not able to call in neutrophils and other buddies to kind of start the healing process, clear out any kind of insults. You can also, this is usually what uh, causes a lot of pneumonia seen in victims uh, several days later. Um, associated with uh, cutaneous burns is that they had some kind of smoke inhalation toxic injury that they didn't show many other signs of, but they uh, were, they poisoned their macrophages, did not get proper chemotaxis, then developed uh, pneumonia. So with all, all burn victims uh, in enclosed spaces, go ahead and be on the lookout if they're, uh, if they are inpatient, uh, be on lookout for uh, development of pneumonia later on. So you might be asking yourself, okay, how far do I work up a patient for uh, smoke inhalation, smoke toxicity, and that sort of stuff? Like, do I put all my patients through an extremely thorough uh, evaluation? Do I uh, scope them all to check out their uh, airways and all that? Well, your suspicion should for smoke toxicity, thermal injury, any of that should increase if uh, the fire uh, was indoors uh, or an enclosed space that the victim was present in. There's an acrid smell of smoke on the victim's clothes, so you may not be able to get a full history when a victim comes in, either they're unconscious or uh, something else is going on. Just smelling them, you can tell that they've been in a fire that was very smoky. Carefully inspect their mouth, pharynx, uh, nostrils, anything. You're looking for soot. You're looking for... Um, um, burns, abrasions, anything that would tell you that this person had uh, smoke or inhalation or thermal damage. Um, hoarseness and expiratory wheezes are a sign of uh, airway edema, but the lack of uh, hoarseness or expiratory wheezes should not ma make you rule out that this could be a complication for them, okay? They can also have copious mucus production, so seeing a lot of thick white mucus on the back of their their um, pharynx, and then uh, carbonaceous sputum, so black sputum, um, are sure signs of smoke insulation, but again, absence should not rule out. So those are all things that should increase your suspicion that the victim could have smoke toxic toxicity as well as other issues from smoke inhalation, okay? If the patient has a combination history of one, closed fire, fire space, two, carbonaceous sputum, and three, a carboxyhemoglobin level of greater than 10%, those three things, 
uh, have a 96% uh, correlation and with uh, positive bronchoscopy of uh, thermal and smoke uh, toxicity of the uh, airways. Um, presence of just two of those features, it's a correlation of 70%, which is still crazy high, and uh, just one of those features gives you 36%. So any of those three things should give you high suspicion that this person has smoke inhalation injury, that sort of thing. They need to be closely monitored, and you need to work them up uh, for further issues. Or if you are seeing more of the hoarseness and that sort of stuff, um, go ahead and start uh, thinking about um, doing a prophylactic intubation to make sure they don't lose their airway. Um, something to note is upper airway edema, very closely uh, correlated with um, flash burns. So anything explosive, being around campfire, sudden incendiary things like the kid threw a bunch of diesel in the campfire to, to make it go up faster and it all flashed in his face. Um, these kind of incidents, usually you get those thermal burns of the uh, nasopharynx that cause the upper airway edema, and you really should, really, really should strongly consider uh, prophylactic airway intubation, okay? So I talked about a second ago that um, uh, often they come in either unconscious or uh, confused and not able to give you a proper history. Uh, the rescuers are often the most important historians and should be closely questioned. This doesn't necessarily mean the EMS or the uh, firemen. It means uh, people who pulled them out of the burning building. Were they unconscious on the floor when you pulled them out? What was going on? Were they confused sitting on the floor? Were they trying to rescue something? Um, getting that history and relaying it uh, to subsequent, subsequent uh, healthcare team can be very important uh, to give them a a full um, diagnostic picture of what they should be looking for, what they should suspect, especially when it comes to smoke inhalation injury. Um, again, like I said, uh, carby, uh, <laughs> um, carbon monoxide levels should be obtained um, as soon as they get into uh, the ER. So blood gases should be immediately run. Um, Elevated uh, um, uh, carboxyhemoglobin or any clinical symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning um, you should go ahead and uh, presume that there's also smoke uh, inhalation toxicity, okay, smoke poisoning. Um, in very smoky fires, uh, carboxyhemoglobin can get up to 40, 50%. Again, this is danger zone. This is coma zone, even after two to three minutes of exposure. So this is why you should never run into a burning building, guys, okay? I don't care. The movies make it come completely out like if you take a bucket of water, douse yourself and run into the building, you will be fine. You'll be able to sell, save everybody. You have two minutes before you pass out uh, from the uh, carbon monoxide. Putting a wet cloth over your face is not going to protect you from the carbon monoxide levels. You will pass out. You will die most likely from um, the carbon, carbon monoxide toxicity, but you could also have the building fall down on you while you're unconscious. So don't run into burning buildings unless you're a fireman wearing full protective gear, okay? Um, anyone suspected of smoke poisoning should have uh, a set of arterial bl blood gases drawn, like I said, uh, and you're looking for an improper ratio of arteri arterial partial pressure of oxygen uh, to the fraction of inspired oxygen, so the uh, PaO2 to the FiO2, so the PF rate ratio. Normal is between 400 to 500. Less than 400, you assume toxicity. Less than 250, you intubate, okay? Less than 250, you intubate. Um, fiber optic bronchoscopy should be only used when you doubt your diagnosis, okay? It shouldn't be used on everyone. It's super cheap. It's super easy to do. It's not terribly comfortable, but you can do it. Um, but really, you only need to do it if you don't have any of the other uh, clinical history. Uh, you don't uh, have any of the odd blood gases, the, the, um, the black uh, sputum in the throat. Any of those things can help you just make the diagnosis clinically and go from there. The, you don't need to add the extra step of fiber optic bronchoscopy unless you are unsure about your diagnosis. You are leaning towards saying they don't have uh, inhalation injury, smoke toxicity, carbon monoxide toxicity, but you want to make sure for some reason fiber op optic bronchoscopy would kind of be your go-to. This is all stuff we have pretty much covered. It's just kind of a little bit of a recap. Basically, when you pull someone out of a fire, you slap a mask on them, 100% oxygen. Um, uh, if you uh, can, if you have uh, capability to measure uh, carboxyhemoglobin in the field, um, which I'm not sure those are carried on rigs, that that blood quick uh, lab set. But uh, if you can do it, but most likely you're waiting until you get to the ER. So keeping that oxygen on them all the way to the ER. Um, 
victim demonstrates labor breathing, prolonged transport time is uh, anticipated, go ahead and tube them. Uh, you want to protect their airway. That is your most crucial job is to protect their airway. This is going out to more of you EMS folks, uh, people who are working first responders, flight crew, that sort of thing. Um, mucosal burns of the mouth, nasopharynx, larynx, uh, will cause edema formation, uh, can lead to upper airway obstruction anytime within the first 24 hours. You Having those things present um, automatically signs the patient up for an intubation if they are willing, um, because you really want to, to pr uh, protect those airways. Uh, it, it is, again, more pro prophylactic, but again, if they lose that airway, you are in, you're up the creek. is <laughs> is not good. Uh, basically, you have to um, hope that you can... Um, uh, give them a tracheotomy and the, they don't have enough swelling that uh, prevents you from even doing that. Um, and then uh, mucosal burns, uh, rarely uh, full thickness. Um, other than the edema, within the first 24 hours, they heal generally pretty, pretty well with just good oral hygiene. So just thinking more outpatient afterwards, uh, not much you have to do for these. Okay. Oh, what if I tube them? What do I do then? Well, the tube stays in place for two to five days. So again, for, uh, 24 to 72 hours is kind of where uh, you can get that edema for, formation. So you want to make sure you're past that threshold. Um, and what you're really uh, observing while they're on tubes, uh, th while they're intubated, um, is uh, their pulmonary function. Uh, smoke poisoning can affect it in a bunch of different ways. Basically, decreased um, functional residual capacity, so decreased lung vo volume and vital capacity is, is often observed. Um, you kind of will see more of an obstructive disease um, within their uh, respiratory studies uh, that kind of show that reduction of flow rates, uh, increased dead space, rapid decrease in compliance. Uh, patients who you're doing it more pro prophylactically for aren't that, who aren't having a lot of these toxic responses, um, you can uh, be more gentle with the vent settings and that sort of thing. You're basically uh, letting them drive the, the respiration. Um, but patients who... Uh, Having uh, more issues uh, with the toxic damage, that sort of stuff, you have to be a little bit more aggressive with uh, their vent settings. Without a bunch of associated burns, mortality from smoke poisoning is actually very low. Um, very rarely uh, do you get full progression to acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, and usually uh, just symptomatic treatment leads to complete resolution within a few days. Uh, but if you have burns, basically they eat burns and uh, smoke poisoning um, double the rate of mortality from burns of any size. So basically have either alone, you're, you're less likely to have complications, but it, both together, you're much more likely to have uh, complications. Um, pulmonary symptoms, hypoxia, rails, ronchi, wheezes, all of those, um, seldom present on admission, but can appear 12 to 48 hours after exposure. Again, you're getting that uh, edema first 24 to 72 hours. Um, and in general, er earliest onset symptoms, um, the more severe the disease. So if you're having a patient already coming in with these symptoms, they're much more likely to have issues and, and uh, worse progression um, and prognosis than someone who developed uh, a little bit of wheezing and stuff uh, the night after. Um, and uh, basically, in the case of any kind of uh, laryngeal edema, nasotracheal um Oral tracheal intubation is indicated. You, you need to do it. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, if it, I wasn't quite clear about it, tracheostomy is never an emergency procedure and sh uh, certainly should be avoided as initial airway management in victims with burns to the face and neck. Basically, what that is saying is you should not have to uh, do a tracheostomy later on as an emergency procedure. You should have already prophylactically intubated that patient to protect their airway. So if you eventually have uh, swelling and edema after they reach the ER, that, uh, that compromises their airway. It's because you should have already protected it because they, they most likely showed the signs um, that they needed uh, prophylactic intubation. Um, mild cases of smoke poisoning aren't really having any other issues, usually treated with highly humidified air, 100% uh, oxygen, uh, and a vigorous pulmonary toilet, uh, which uh, I'm not going to go over too much, but you can look at pulmonary toilet. I had to. And it's basically all the different um, uh, respiratory therapy things you can do, including uh, spirometry, um, forced exhalation, um, 
uh, and different things kind of break up mucus, get uh, your ciliary network going to clear any bacteria or any kind of crud uh, in the lungs to keep them from um, getting pneumonia and that sort of thing um, later down the line. So um, then you can also uh, use breathing treatments for, with uh, bronchodilators as needed, especially for victims who suffer from asthma as well. So close monitoring of them. Um, blood gases, again, we said you draw as soon as you get to the R, but how about after that? You draw at least uh, every four hours, uh, checking the PF ratio, making sure you're uh, above that 400 range. Again, between the 250 and 400 is is uh, impaired and you need to keep tre uh, treating it below 250, um, you need to intubate. Uh, worsening symptoms, difficult han handling uh, their secretions, falling PF ratio, all indications for intubation respiratory assistance, okay? Uh, if oxygenation is impaired, uh, you can increase the positive and end expiratory pressure uh, on their ventilation settings. Um, or if you're, they're not intubated, uh, a CPAP uh, can be initiated to increase um, by increments of three to five centimeters H2O until no further impairment of that PF ratio is, is observed. So basically increasing that um, end expiratory pressure either with the CPAP or with the vent settings to um, get them to oxygenate a little bit better. So we have them in the ER, um, we've done our assessment and everything, who stays, who goes, who can be outpatient, who needs to be monitored heavily, that sort of stuff. Um, any victim showing signs of smoke inhalation and has more than trivial burns should be admitted. Honestly, just the smoke inhalation signs alone could be admitted, but if they have that on top of burns, like we said, that doubles their morbidity. Um, so you want to admit them um, very aggressively. Uh, and not saying you have to force them, but really, really, um, advocating for them to stay. Um, prophylactic antibiotics do not have any use at this point. Um, at this point, it's more chemical pneumonitis. People who develop new, uh, pneumonia later on um, with burns, it's going to be, you know, uh, several days later. Um, and it's going to be due uh, to them, uh, again, that macrophage poisoning, um, losing their ciliary uh, ladder and stuff in, in their uh, airways. Uh, but that's going to come much later. Um, what the symptoms they're having currently is more of a chemical pneumonitis and um, and what you can do if you give uh, uh, antibiotics now is you can actually breed resistant organisms um, by early use that can eventually cause a very severe pneumonia in them later. So do not use prophylactic antibiotics early on. Um, Corticosteroids are pretty much only used in victims who also have severe asthma. Otherwise, um, we don't really use them um, much with uh, smoke poisoning. You can use them for their uh, spasmolytic and anti-inflammatory actions, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more on the lines of uh, patients who are already suffering uh, from asthma. If you are having trouble with edema and getting a patient extubated and stuff, you can start uh, considering using um, uh, corticosteroids then, um, but that also might be a little bit more of a provider preference. Um, if burns are greater than 15% total body surface area, victims should be referred to a special care unit. So if you are at a rural location, that is when you kind of start thinking, okay, maybe I need to consider um, flying them out to a um, burn care ward or, um, or transferring them, unless you have someone on staff who's very versed and, and, and feels comfortable taking care of them. Um, in absence of burns, admission uh, depends on severity of symptoms, basically. So any pre-existing uh, medical condition, especially COPD with uh, people who have smoke inhalation injury. Um, and, and then anybody who has previous history of CAD, myocardial infarct, anything like that, um, or simply has social circumstances that they can't be watched closely, have nobody around them that they that can kind of monitor them overnight, make sure they're going to be okay. Otherwise, healthy victims with only mild symptoms, so this is just kind of expiratory wheezes every once in a while, mild sputum production, um, their carboxyhemoglobin levels less than 10%, normal blood gas levels generally, uh, they can be watched for an hour or two and then discharge if they have a place to go home and they have someone to stay with them. You want them monitored at least overnight, um, mo probably through the better part of the next day too, because remember that edema most likely sets in with the first 24 hours, can go as far as 72 hours. So you definitely want them monitored, monitored even if you're discharging. So uh, victims with pre-existing uh, cardiovascular or pulmonary d disease should be admitted. Okay, even if um, they aren't really having many uh, uh, symptoms related to the smoke, um, if they have any kind of uh, 
abnormal uh, findings or they do have a strong clinical history of um, having that smoke toxicity, you should admit them and watch them overnight, okay? Victims with uh, moderate symptoms, so general wheezing, uh, mild hoarseness, moderate sput sputum production, carboxyhemoglobin levels 5 to 10%, um, but still kind of generalized normal blood gas levels should be admitted um, uh, for close uh, observation and treated kind of the same as asthma victims. So if they're has having a lot of that uh, edema, wheezing and stuff, you can go ahead and, and begin cort corticosteroids and stuff to the point, you know, if they're bad to the point where they have pre-existing conditions and um, and they have symptoms, then you can you can consider using it. Uh, again, that's that's going to be a little bit of a provider uh, preference there. Um, then the patient with severe symptoms, air hunger, severe wheezing, copious sputum that can or cannot be uh, carbonaceous. Uh, and then if they have any abnormal, like big abnormal blood gas values, um, immediately intubate, ventilatory support, and send to the int intensive care setting. Again, that intubation is going to last two to five days, and then you can start thinking about extubating them. But they need close monitoring, and you need to be very careful for these individuals. All right, so once the airway is established and resuscitation is on the way, um, burn victims are uh, pretty suitable for uh, transport. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about different kinds of transport, uh, what, what you're doing, if you're in rural locations, that sort of thing. This is just to kind of give you an idea. This probably doesn't pertain to many of you, but, you know, this is just kind of good to have in the back of your mind, especially if a patient's family says, hey, what's going to happen to them now? Um, just some stuff to know. So resuscitation uh, can continue en route from the site to the uh, emergency room. Um, usually, for the most part, uh, patients will re remain fairly stable uh, for several days. Um, unless they have severe burns, severe injuries, severe smoke inhalation injuries, that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, burn, burns are generally pretty stable uh, unless they cover a very large uh, amount of surface area. Uh, hospitals without specialized burn care facilities need to decide uh, on admin, hey, are we going to refer these patients um, or are we going to keep them here and treat them? It needs to be based off of one, like we said earlier, total body surface area of the wound or of the burn um, is going to play the, hu the biggest factor. Um, and then also whether that facility is equipped and there's someone on staff who is comfortable enough to treat the burn in question. Okay? If you don't have the facility, you don't have the staff, um, or the burn is just so severe, or it, it encompasses head, uh, genitals, hands, feet, something um, that can uh, turn out very poorly, then you need to uh, work on referring them. Uh, emergency uh, room or um, or care center um, in a rural area should already have in their back pocket uh, some numbers uh, and facilities that they have agreements with for transferring and everything that they can just call up and say, hey, this is what I have, um, and can I send them to you? This is when you really need to be able to estimate total body surface area. Um, we'll talk about fluid resuscitation here in a minute, but you have to be able to tell them how you've um, what you've used for fluid resuscitation, are they intubated, are they cardiac stable, and and do all of these things before uh, you can ship them over. Um, the method of shipping kind of depends on where you're at. If it's less than 50 miles, Grand Ambulance is pretty satisfactory, so hospital to hospital, basically. Um, and then if it's 50 to 150 miles, most people kind of prefer helicopter if it's available. Above uh, 150 miles, then they basically have to be life flighted. Um, and the nice thing, if they are life lighted, um, most of those flights are carrying intensive care unit um, equipment on board, and they're ready for uh, critical care and peculiarities of, of burn victims and, um, uh, along the way. All right. So, what is your if you're an ER physician, um, what is your job before you transfer to another uh, facility of care? Well, um, first is to basically make sure that the patient is stable. So you're going to be making sure they have been fluid resuscitated, are stable, they're not hypovolemic. Um, they're going to check their cardiac status, making sure they're not having a ca cardiac abnormality, especially if they have pre-existing conditions. And then the biggest thing is you need to decide whether or not to intubate the patient. Um, intubating, uh, having to intubate a patient on route is extremely difficult. Also monitoring a patient um, 
is a little harder too because of uh, noise, especially in helicopters, that sort of thing. So you need to make sure the patient has two large uh, bore IVs, uh, is intubated if they have any concern of protecting their airway so that uh, if anything happens along the flight, they uh, can be quickly stabilized without having to do any kind of procedures that are extremely hard to do in a small vehicle. Okay, you also need to go ahead and wrap them um, in uh, warm uh, warm blankets, dressing, bulky dressings. Um, you can get a mylar sheet from the flight crew. All of these are is to help uh, maintain body tempers, temperature, especially if you are sending someone uh, that has um, very large surface area burns, so surface area burns above 20% because they have lost a lot of their thermal um, insulation capacity, and so they can get hi uh, hypothermic extremely, extremely quickly. You want to make sure that that patient is as stable as they can possibly be and are not going to have problems en route to the hospital. That is your um, that is your responsibility as the referring physician, okay? The burns themselves actually can be fairly well ignored for a while, unless, you know, hey, you have circumfer circumferential eschars or uh, something causing... Um, uh, compression, uh, compartment syndrome, that sort of thing. You can generally ignore burns. Burns are going to keep. It's the uh, fluid uh, resuscitation in the airway that you need to be focusing on. Burns, if they're going to be transferred the, ne the next day within the next 24 hours, you can just lightly dress them and basically hand it off and, and tell them what you've done and, and, and leave it to them. Burns, uh, burns can keep for a bit. Uh, it's not going to immediately kill them. It's not going to be uh, a huge issue immediately. This is, does not include uh, chemical burns. Chem chemical burns need to be treated, need to be flushed, that sort of stuff. Um, using common sense there. And basically, um, regular burns, fl flame burns, scalds, that sort of thing, um, that can be uh, dressed and um, and uh, do light debridement and basically send them on their way, especially if you want to get them over to a new facility fairly quickly. All right, like I was just saying. Uh, primary role for the emergency physician is to forget about the burn. We are focusing on resuscitation. Um, although the burn is readily apparent and very often dramatic, and it's like it's the injury you want to jump on. It's like, oh, I can start to breathing and start treating and dressing and doing all these things. That is not what's going to threaten the victim's life. It's their, it's their, um, it's going to be their cardiovascular status. Are they hypovolemic? Are again, and with those very large uh, wounds, you're getting the systemic capillary permeability. You're shoving tons of fluid and protein into the interstitial space. You're overloading the heart. You're um, messing with the kidneys. Bad things are happening systemically, and if you don't take care of that, that is going to be uh, what kills the patient. Uh, cardiovascular changes can begin even immediately after a, a very large burn. The extent of these changes depends primarily on the size of the burn and to a lesser extent the, the depth, but it's mostly the size and the inflammatory uh, insult. Uh, most victims uh, with uncomplicated burns, less than 15% total body surface area, can just do oral fluid resuscitation uh, with some electrolytes and salt-containing solution, okay? You can just have them orally rehydrate, which is, you know, it, as we all know, oral is best. But if the burn is extending past 20% uh, total body surface area, they're not going to be able to orally rehydrate enough to compensate for the massive shifts of fluid and electrolytes that is occurring. Um, reversal of the shifts begins during the second post-burn day, but basically you have to keep them stable until then. Um, normal extracellular volume is not completely restored till about 7 to 10 days after the burn, so you really need to be monitoring them closely um, or at least get them to a stable point before even considering uh, transferring. Um, and um, unless the intravascular volume is uh, depleted, you kind of get the classic hypovolemic shock uh, occurring in that, that pathway, which we'll kind of talk more about in just a second. The consequences, if you don't, are one, they're either going to have cardiovascular collapse or they're going to have irreversible acute tubular necrosis and renal failure, which is going to lead to uh, losing both their kidneys and then eventually uh, having cardiovascular collapse, basically. So, very important. There are a ton of kind of uh, resuscitation algorithms and plans and stuff out there. Um, we're going to go over a certain one, um, but there, there are different ones uh, based on institutions, so you should check with your hospital, ER, or whatever, um, on what their uh, particular algorithms and policies are. But this is something you can generally use. Um, so nearly all these plans pretty much use a combination of colloid and crystalloid uh, solutions. Um, and, but uh, the ratios that they use vary depending on which uh, kind of algorithm you're using. Um, 
and then also the timing of the colloid administration, sodium concentration um, of the crystalloid solution, and also the total volume can um, fluctuate a little bit. Um, so again, just you need to choose a plan and stick with it. Um, some require frequent uh, changing of solutions, others require mixing of solutions, and uh, some require you being careful monitoring the patient's electrolytes. So you need to be well versed in what plan you're going to use beforehand and, you know, stick with it and, 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 and know what you need to monitor and how it's going to affect the patient. Uh, victims with very large burns most likely need both colloid and crystalloid. Um, and uh, initially, capillaries are permeable to both uh, the colloid and crystalloid uh, solutions, capillary uh, leak of albumin, other large uh, molecules. Usually, uh, subsides about 6 to 24 hours, but just know that while you're initially trying to resuscitate uh, them, they uh, may just be having all, all of what you're putting in going straight into the interstitial space. So let's kind of I put a little algorithm chart here on the side on how kind of the cardiovascular uh, insult works. So you get the initial burn um, happening. It releases uh, vasoactive peptides in the area, alters the capillary permeability for large wounds. This happens systemically. You start losing fluid into the interstitial space, causing hypovolemia. You uh, have decreased cardiac output due to the hypovolemia, which you get decreased myocardial function as well. Decreased uh, renal blood flow leading to uh, renal failure. Um, and then you get altered pulmonary resistance, causing pulmonary edema, <laughs> um, which can then lead to infection, SIRS, and um, basically multi-organ failure. Um, so bad things happen if you don't properly regulate uh, the cardiovascular system. So what I've attached here is the uh, baxter parkland formula. Uh, it's the one uh, advocated in the um, Auerbach Wilner's Medicine uh, Manual. And you, it's it's uh, one of the easier ones to, to kind of go with. Again, there's a lot of different uh, algorithms out there, but this one is pretty straightforward. Um, first 24 hours, uh, you're using um, Ringer's lactate, four milliliters per kilogram um, per percent uh, total uh, body surface area of the burn in the first 24 hours. One half in the first eight hours, other half in the second 16 hours. Um, and then you have some examples of how to calculate that. The second 24 hours, albumin or plasma at maintenance, um, basically you have less of that capillary permeability at this point, so you can uh, keep on board more of what you're uh, putting in um, and kind of tells you how to maintain it uh, that way. Um, again, this isn't something I'm expecting you to remember um, right now. Check with your institution, see what their uh, their resuscitation formula for burn victims is, uh, and and learn that one. That's the one you should go with. Um, patients with burns that involve less than 10% of total body surface area again don't need uh, fluid resuscitation. Do it orally. Um, patients burns 10 to 20 percent. Um, often also do not require uh, intravenous uh, fluid resuscitation. Uh, it, with the, these size burns, really making sure they're getting enough electrolytes um, and sodium, okay? Um, and uh, you can check a hydration status of these uh, individuals just by their clinical presentation. So um, looking at the oral mu uh, mucous membranes, uh, also looking at the conjunctiva. Um, a cool trick is if you ta take someone's hand, uh, hand in your hand, uh, lay your uh, four fingers over their four fingers and bend back their fingers into extension position. Then look at the... Um, the skin uh, creases and then see if uh, they're red or white. Uh, if they blanch completely, um, that means they're probably uh, dehydrated. If they do not blanch completely, then they uh, have a less likelihood of being dehydrated. That works really well for kiddos uh, in particular. Um, patients with burns greater than 20% uh, total body surface area should re do need to uh, receive IV fluid uh, resuscitation with the crystalloid uh, solution. Um, uh, en route to the ER, and then at the ER, you can use whatever formula uh, you're using uh, by your particular algorithm. Burns of less than 50% um, total body surface area can usually uh, be resuscitated with one large core IV. If they have greater than 50%, um, they should have two large core IVs. Generally, what uh, people in rigs do uh, nowadays is, is go ahead and uh, stick the second large core IV in just in case. Um, these uh, IVs should not um, go in the lower extremities because um, uh, 
because of the uh, coagulation risk uh, in the lower extremities, uh, very high incidence of septic uh, thrombophlebitis. Um, so you should keep it in the upper extremities, even if you have to pass through uh, burned skin, which seems kind of hard um, for those of us who are not uh, as practiced at um, at, uh, at putting in lines. But um, for well-seasoned uh, nurses and uh, EMS professionals, those those individuals most likely will be able to do it properly. So just making sure that you have um, appropriate backup um, access. So continuing to talk about IV access, uh, victims with burns larger than 50% of the total body surface area or who have associated medical problems um, are or are at the extremities age, so young kids or older older adults um, who also have smoke inhalation. <laughs> Basically, all these things uh, kind of guarantee that, hey, in addition to the two large bore IVs, we're also going to... Um, uh, do some central venous pressure monitoring, okay? Um, if they're in an extremely unstable state um, or have burns over 65% of the total body surface area, they should be monitored in intensive care with a swan gas catheter uh, to make sure you can uh, measure that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and make sure they're getting proper cardiac output um, because you may not be able to totally tell when they're seeming so, so sick and so unstable. Uh, you, want, you want close monitoring of that. Um, again, uh, if you have uh, really bad burns to the extremities, you can always uh, uh, do an, an IO um, interosseous uh, line um, in case you can't uh, get a peripheral line. So just remember you have that in your back pocket as well. Um, do know that the presence of myoglobinuria, uh, I can barely say that word, <laughs> alters your resuscitation plan, okay? That basically means that the kidneys are going to be in trouble. They're taking fire. Myoglobinuria um, results from any destruction in muscle cells. So you're going to get these with full thickness to fourth degree burns um, that are uh, really uh, harming the musculature. Um, and, um, and it's usually when uh, someone has a crush injury, electrical burns, or very deep, deep, deep thermal burns. Okay, uh, crush injuries in particular, remember the guy I told you about the hot metal plate that fell, crushed his leg in addition to the burns? Well, you have the crush injury in addition um, to the thermal burns. Um, remember that most of these individuals, if they're extremely sick, are gonna have that, you're are gonna have a, um, uh, catheter in place. So you'll, you can, uh, always with a burn victim, if they have a catheter in place, check the bag, uh, next to their bed, see what their urine output is and see what color it is. That cola colored urine is characteristic of the myoglobinuria. Um, and, um, it's an indication to increase the amount of fluid, get, fluid you're giving and establish a diuresis of 70 to 100 milliliters of urine per hour. So basically, you're wanting to quickly flush it, keep that concentration of myoglobinuria as little as possible, passing through the kidneys at one time, because again, it is very toxic to the kidneys and it can cause renal failure. Um, an additional bolus of 25 milligrams of mannitol in adults, um, and then 0.5 to 1 gram to, per kilogram in kids. Um, with a repeat dose of 15 to 30 minutes should be considered um, to try and prevent um, uh, renal injury. Hey, like I was saying, uh, all victims undergoing IV resuscitation of fluids should have an indwelling uh, urinary catheter place. Uh, you can't expect these individuals to be able to get up and pee on their own, especially if they're extremely sick, sick or unstable. Do not put fluids into a person without having a line for fluids to go out, okay? <laughs> Uh, unless they are extremely mobile, um, you really want to make sure you have a urinary catheter also so you can uh, observe color of their urine and, and have a close close line on that and, and know what's going on with their kidney function. Um, arterial lines are very useful in victims who need frequent assessing of blood gas levels. So if they've had smoke inhalation, go ahead and consider putting in an arterial line too so you're not having to, having to poke them every four hours because, again, you need to check it every four hours. Um, or if they're going to need blood sampling for anything else. So go ahead and uh, have an arterial line put in so you can get quick access to that. And the patient will appreciate you not poking them with that sharp needle constantly. Um, so the necessary lab work um, needed in the resuscitation phase is pretty minimal. Basically, you're doing those blood gases um, every four hours. Um, and then depending on which resuscitation formula uh, you choose, uh, you can sometimes uh, need to go ahead and check uh, the electrolyte values as well. Um, and may, if you have to have a major operative procedure, such as fasciotomy, multiple escharotomies, and so you're removing multiple of those, we'll talk about how to do that in a sec, um, you're expected um, 
uh, to go ahead and send out blood for typing. So if they have pretty bad um, uh, burns and you're expecting to have to do any kind of surgical procedure in the future that is going to require an OR, go ahead and cross type and match them so that you uh, you don't have to worry about that in the future. Um, the surgeon will like you for doing that if you're in the ER. Um, Determination of uh, blood gas levels is mandatory, and basically you keep monitoring them until they have normal black blood gas levels. Um, arterial pH measurement is super useful uh, in just assessing overall treatment of shock as well. If you're using the Baxter formula there on the right for resuscitation, you don't need to frequent uh, electrolyte um, uh, levels uh, because the levels will kind of re remain in a fairly uh, stable range. Um, but depending on what kind of colloids and stuff you're using um, with other formulas, you do have to check those. Um, by 48 hours, uh, careful monitoring of serum, serum, sodium, and potassium levels becomes pretty important um, because high levels of uh, circulating aldosterone can uh, result in an increase in renal, renal potassium uh, excretion. So basically, if you're having any kind of uh, renal issues or you're having decreased perfusion of the kidneys, that can uh, result in increased aldosterone secretion, release you, uh, result in your kidneys throwing out more potassium, and that can... Uh, cause um, hypokalemia and then result in cardiac issues later. Um, so you do want to check that. Uh, go ahead and get uh, sodium potassium levels uh, done with a uh, CMP, okay? All right, I promise this is our last uh, slide on resuscitation uh, consideration stuff. Uh, these are just a little other little things to keep in the back of your mind uh, as you're treating these patients. Um, more uh, important for emergency med and internal med folks in the ICU. Uh, evaporative water loss uh, to varying degrees through SCAR dramatically increases the free water requirements for burn victims. So the more SCARs you have, um, the more you're going to have to keep your um, patients hydrated and really paying attention to their hematocrit, uh, any signs that they are showing for dehydration. Hemoglobin and hematocrit le uh, levels are initially pretty high and will remain high um, or normal until a third or fourth post burn day again. Um, when you lose a lot of that fluid into your interstitial space, the concentration of your blood cells increases, your hematocrit increases, so it can throw everything off a bit. Um, the blood glucose level is commonly elevated because um, uh, the increased uh, catecholamines uh, glucon <laughs> gluconeogenic effect, so basically uh, increased formation uh, of glucose um, and, and increased uh, glucocorticoid and glucagon levels, relative uh, insulin uh, resistance as well. Basically, it's called stress diabetes. Uh, it can become a problem uh, in normal patients. Um, if uh, glucose-containing solutions are given during resuscitation. Most of the formulas uh, for burn resuscitation do not include um, uh, dextrose uh, uh, solutions until a few days later. Um, but uh, if you are giving a dextrose solution, say, not saying you can't do it, just you want to monitor their blood glucose and make sure, making sure you're not uh, giving them too much. Uh, do remember that increased blood glucose does increase uh, propensity for infections. Um, all diabetic patients require careful monitoring because of this uh, phenomenon. And um, urine uh, glucose levels uh, particularly should be monitored to make sure you're not having um, a hyperglycemic event. Um, do uh, you should be giving uh, proper uh, insulin uh, maintenance to, to any diabetic patients coming in uh, and making sure you're keeping track of, uh, of all that. Uh, you you will switch them from any of their oral medications to that uh, to IV insulin uh, if you're already having them hooked up to an IV for fluid resuscita resuscitation. So it's pretty easy to uh, get a proper uh, control on their blood glucose levels. Um, all medications during the shock phase of burn, so that's kind of within that first 24 hours when you have all the capillary permeability, um, should be given intravenously. If later on you do decide that you no longer have to maintain them um, uh, through IV access, you can try uh, doing oral rehydration. I would not take out their IV lines until you're sure they can maintain oral fluids. Um, subcutaneous intramuscular injections usually um, are unreliable and should be avoided, especially if you already have the IV access, go ahead and use IV um, to its fullest extent. Talking about pain control. So with the full thickness burns or deep partial thickness burns, remember, 
that most of the free nerve endings are burned away. So when you're uh, debriding and that sort of stuff in those middle areas, it'll be um, pretty pain free. Uh, but remember that circumferential area is still going to have um, a lot of those uh, nerve endings intact. So it's going to be painful on those areas. Um, so you uh, should be uh, maintaining very small IV doses of morphine until their pain is under control, but you do not want to affect their blood pressure. Uh, remember, we are really trying hard to resuscitate them with fluids because of this systemic capillary uh, permeability response. So they're already hypovolemic. If you add, um, if you add uh, the um, opioids on board, you can cause a vasodilative response and cause uh, further hypovolemia and um, and basically uh, reduce the work you're doing. So you do want to be very careful with how you're using morphine, okay? Um, do note that uh, patients with very large surface area burns are going to um, have problems thermoregulating, so you're going to have them shivering quite a lot. Um, so that is to be uh, that is to be expected. Um, do make sure that you're not uh, putting uh, cold fluids into them. So if you're doing any uh, IV rehydration, you need to be doing warm fluids um, because they can uh, lose their uh, their heat quite uh, quite quickly. And making sure um, to cover with the, them with appropriate dr uh, thick dressings and blankets when you're not doing any treatments and stuff to to maintain their uh, core temperature as much as possible. One thing to note is in the past, dress ulceration of the stomach and duodenum was a huge complication, super scary, uh, happened quite a lot with uh, burn victims, up to 30%. Now uh, we protect the gastric mucosa by um, immediately feeding uh, through a small nasogastric tube or um, decreasing gastric acidity with um, histamine uh, receptor antagonists, proton pump inhibitors and the like. Um, so just note that that is something that you do need to um, initiate um, early on in their care uh, when you admit them. Okay, now we get to talk about something other than resuscitation. Uh, so we only have a few slides left, and I'm going to talk about some of the more uh, kind of detail-oriented stuff you do uh, procedure-wise, and then also what you can do um, after uh, the patient has been discharged. So starting with procedure stuff, uh, let's talk about escherotomies. Um, so these are uh, usually with those uh, deep thickness uh, to full thickness burns. Um, and uh, it's when that dermis turns into that black charred eschar that no longer is uh, functional, but instead is impeding proper blood flow, proper regeneration of the tissue um, from coming in and, and coming over top of it. So um, these uh, escars can often uh, impede uh, any kind of uh, fluid propagation too. So if you get a circumferential circumferential uh, escar, say around your uh, forearm, that goes all the way around your arm in a circle, is a, a deep partial to full thickness burn, and you have that black dermis, you can get um, uh, basically complete impediment of flow to that distal part of your extremity um, and can cause... Um, it can cause tissues to die. Basically, you could lose lose your hand just be, from gangrene because you have complete occlusion. So those type of escars do, do need to be completely surgically debrided um, very quickly to prevent uh, that sort of thing from happening. Uh, other escars uh, eventually do need to be uh, debrided uh, off. That way, um, tissue you can uh, again reperforate uh, that area and and start to epithelialize over. Or if you need to put a skin graft over the top of it, you can do that. You have to remove the escar first. Basically, basically. It's these big, uh, thick, black, thickened pieces of dermis. Um, it's not going to be very painful or, or painful at all uh, with it, with the removal of these, um, because again, um, if you've if you formed an eschar, you've completely destroyed all all components uh, within that uh, that dermal layer, and so you've completely destroyed the free nerve endings. So you're not going to have um, much pain or any pain. Sorry. <laughs> What you can get pain with is um, the findings of compartment syndrome. So like we talked about just earlier, having the edema with nowhere for that uh, fluid to flow. Um, and that is when you start getting uh, heavy uh, compression of any of the uh, nerves, muscles, anything within that compartment. So say you have, again, that forearm uh, circumferential escar, you have severe edema forming in that, uh, that hand. Uh, if you don't relieve that pressure, you're gonna have uh, uh, quite a lot of nerve damage to that area. So 
that's where fasciotomies, escherotomies, and that sort of stuff uh, come in. Classic findings of compartment syndrome, usually considered pain, paresthesia in that distal area, pulselessness, tense swelling, um, which may or may not be present in the burned uh, extremity. Um, so you're just kind of looking at clinically, seeing what's going on. If you do suspect uh, you having uh, compartment syndrome, you should check uh, distal pulses uh, with a Doppler ultrasound. And if uh, they are absent, then the escherotomy needs to be performed immediately. So that is either um, a semi-sterile procedure in a procedure room within the ER, or if you are able to quickly get them up to an OR to do that uh, within the OR as well. Um, Escherotomies performed in the hospital does not require an anesthetic. Again, uh, the full thickness uh, burn is excised, uh, and you're not having any of those pain uh, from the nerve endings. Um, and you'll actually have relief of the pain in the the compartment syndrome extremity once you do have um, have that flow uh, restored. Um, the incision is made directly through the eschar into the subcutaneous tissue, first along the lateral aspect uh, of the extremity, and if the symptoms do not really improve, then along the medial aspect as well. Incisions do not be, need to be as deep as the uh, fascia uh, investing the muscle. Um, uh, and bleeding is uh, usually controlled with an electro uh, cautery or just uh, topical clotting agent stuff. I remember, you are going to have a bit of bleeding. You wouldn't have bleeding from uh, from debridement above the subcutaneous layer, but once you get into subcutaneous layer and below, then you can start having bleeding again because you do have perfusion again um, within those layers. Um, okay. Uh, arrival to the hospital will be within six hours. Escherotomy should not be done in the field, okay? Um, because again, you can have bleeding if they are profusely bleeding uh, from an escherotomy. If you don't have the proper equipment to control the bleeding, it can lead to exsanguination, okay? So if you are going to be a hospital within six hours, you need to uh, wait, okay? Um, circumferential full thickness burns of the trunk in small children um, occasionally uh, demand a escherotomy to improve uh, pulmonary function. So you look at a lot of those pictures of burn victims and you see that they've been pretty much slashed down their sides uh, in the middle of their chest in, in uh, different lines. That's because the burns basically take away all, if they have a full trunk torso burn, that those burns take away the elasticity of the skin tissue. And what they're doing is they're relieving that compression of the chest chest cavity of the lungs to improve breathing. Um, and they look really gnarly. If you go, I didn't put one on here, I should have, but um, if you go online and just uh, look all, up escherotomies, uh, you'll see just basically bilateral cuts down sides uh, of people with full torso burns and stuff. And that's all to get, give uh, that compress, relieve that compression of the chest cavity, allowing them to actually breathe fully. Uh, you don't want them suffocating to death. Um, and then, um, and, and patients like that, uh, you're going to eventually need to send to a, uh, a fully equipped uh, burn care center because those are going to be extremely difficult to treat. They are going to need skin grafts. They are going to need quite a lot of rehabilitation and stuff. So they, th those are really serious um, uh, complications. You in, in a rural area, you do need to know how to do it if you know a patient uh, is struggling to breathe because of that constriction of those full body burns, you do need to be aware to do it because that is one of the things you have to do to stabilize the patient to get them uh, to the burn care facility. So be aware of how to perform it um, and uh, what to watch out for and how to do it safely. Um, and then uh, I always recommend you to uh, take further training on uh, CME courses and stuff uh, to improve your exposure and stuff because uh, as a normal practitioner, you may not um, see this very often. Um, so if the abdomen is involved, uh, again, with a torso escherotomy, um, inferior margins of the escherotomy be, may be uh, connected uh, transversely. So uh, go online, look at the uh, different incision uh, incision types and panels, and I'll kind of, get, kind of give you an idea of uh, what, you, what you will be doing and what to look out for. Fasciotomies are a little different than escherotomies. So escherotomy would be you are cutting um, those lateral and then medial uh, edges of the escar, um, and then possibly removing those for completely to uh, restore uh, blood flow. Uh, fasciotomy is if you still are not uh, getting a proper pulse um, on Doppler uh, of those uh, extremity portions, and you're still getting the tense swelling, loss of pulses, tingling, or pain. Uh, in that point, you uh, may need to do a cut down or a fasciotomy. And so that is cutting between the uh, fascial planes and relieving that pressure, allowing all that 
that fluid uh, to um, to to be able to leave uh, the compartment and not cause the compression. Again, the reason we're doing this is it one, it's cut, the compression is cutting off blood flow. So um, several several hours later, uh, you're going to have uh, gangrene and stuff set in. Uh, but the uh, more uh, pressing matter is you're causing compression of all the nerves running within that space, and that compression is causing uh, direct damage uh, to those nerves. So this is why uh, you need to you need to be on top of this and you need to uh, know what's going on and evaluate it quickly. Um, again, this should not uh, be done um, uh, in the outpatient setting if you can be in a hospital within six hours, uh, kind of the same rules apply. Um, and then uh, it does need to be uh, in the OR, in the OR if at all possible. Um, if not possible, then it just needs to be in a sterile procedure room, a semi-sterile uh, procedure room. But really, you're trying to preserve function here. So the quicker you can get to it, the better. Um, the need for escherotomy and the burned hand is a little bit more uh, controversial um, because uh, often the skin is so thin there and the fingers are burned so badly uh, if they re require an escherotomy or RA to the point of uh, mummification, basically, um, the uh, musculature and the bone is already um, uh, at play here. Um, and uh, if uh, you take an escar off, you're often taking all the way down to the tendon. If you don't have anything to put on top of it, then you can have uh, some uh, a lot of complications done. Uh, a lot of these all require, uh, if, if it doesn't have bone and tendon involvement that requires amputation, then it is going to require uh, skin grafts and the like. So um, this really is getting closer to being done, something that needs to be done with a specialist and needs to be done uh, sooner rather than later um, to preserve as much joint function as possible. What you do need to do is space out um, each of the phalanges. You need to uh, put gauze in between them to make sure that as any kind of healing process is getting instigated, that they're not adhering together and closing together, that you're going to have to cut them apart later on. So putting um, gauze with sul sulfadizing uh, soaked into them in between those fingers and wrapping them uh, is a more of your safe bet. And then getting someone who is is uh, a surgeon versed in um, these hand reconstruction procedures from burns uh, to to weigh in and see what you need to what what best needs to be done next. Um, burn if escherotomy and stuff with hand uh, you don't really need to do anyway. Um, early on, like I said, burns keep for a little while um, because you're not really dealing with compartment compartment syndrome stuff um, within uh, that distal portion of the hand or anything. More uh, more along the lines of if you were dealing with it in the arm that sort of thing. Um, but one thing you should do is monitor both the palmar arch and the digital vessels uh, with Doppler ultrasound in any significant hand burn. Um, and uh, if uh, those uh, signals do disappear, you should uh, consider a dorsal interosseous uh, fasciotomy. Okay. Um, and that's that would be a little higher up, so that wouldn't be... Uh, um, uh, directly uh, on the fingers. If the fingers are what has the SCAR, it will be on more of the uh, dorsal uh, surface of the hand. I believe in that front or that top left picture, you can see a bit of a, a dorsal fasciotomy there where they cut down uh, in between the fascial planes there to relieve uh, some of the compression and burden. And that's again just to protect uh, the nerves running to those fingers, trying to uh, keep as much, much function in the future as possible. Let's talk about burn wound management. So this is going to be going over uh, debridement, what you put on it, and how you wrap it. And so we talked about this a little bit already, and that was more in the outpatient, you know, at home setting, at the scene, uh, someone who can, you know, if, if it's determined they're less than 15% uh, body surface areas, or if it's very mild burns or something like that, how to dress them there. This is more in the... Um, in the uh, ER uh, in, uh, internal med uh, wound care setting. And when you have a little bit more uh, stuff you can work with and, and what you should kind of be doing. So um, basically the first thing you should do after uh, patient's airways have all been checked, you've uh, resuscitated them, everything else is, is stable and you're doing good, then you can finally turn your eyes towards the burn. Uh, burn should be initially cleansed with a surgical detergent. Um, so you can just use an iodine scrub or something of the like. Um, if it's a very deep uh, burn, maybe not using iodine and, and choosing more to go with chlorhexidine scrubs. Uh, one, it's not not, not going to hurt because you've uh, ripped off a, or burned off a bunch of those uh, nerve endings. But um, iodine can um, 
uh, be a little bit of an irritant to those deeper tissues. So um, iodine, I would go more with the uh, partial thickness to superficial burns, uh, and then chlorhexidine more with uh, those kind of deeper uh, kinds of burns. Um, yeah, I put chlorhexidine on a superficial burn on one lady, and uh, she just about jumped out of her chair. It, it does not feel great. Um, the iodine does not hurt as much um, with those superficial burns where those nerve endings are, are very well intact. Um, then, uh, after you've uh, cleansed it uh, and pat it dry a little bit, no rubbing, don't rub. Um, then uh, start removing uh, all the loose, non-viable skin, so debriding. So again, like we said, p pick up the edges. Anything that comes up freely, you cut off, and you cut all the way until you get back down to the adhered skin. Um, debridement should be done very gently, especially with uh, those uh, more uh, partial thickness superficial ones, because those ones can hurt a bit. Uh, and then if needed, you can use small doses of IV uh, narcotics, uh, morphine and such, um, to get a uh, sufficient uh, analgesia for the procedure. Again, being very careful what you're using, uh, how much you're using morphine with anybody who's having systemic complications from burns, okay? You do not want to cause them hypovolemic shock through um, uh, opioid uh, vasodilation, okay? Um, general anesthesia and oper oper operating room derivant should be avoided until you're completely done with resuscitation. Like I said, burns keep. Um, cardiovascular system does not. Um, so make sure everything's stable before you even consider general anesthesia in the operating room. So this is going to be several days later. Um, this is only unless other procedures um, uh, are necessary. So you're having to do a fasciotomy, a uh, large escherotomy, that sort of thing. Patients uncaught, like stuff that really needs pressing attention, then you might as well do a debridement while you're in there and just be very, very close attention to their um, bulimic status. Um, once the wound is cleansed, you want to start putting a topical chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy uh, agent, um, which, you know, the most common that we all use is silver sulfadiazine. This is pretty much what is used uh, in, um, in the ER in most settings. Bur uh, wound care settings will often use a combination of other things to get better epithelialization and stuff for large burns that you're having a heal over with either skin grafts, contracture, that sort of thing. But your go-to bread and butter should be silver sulfadiazine. Um, the only um, thing uh, to ask about is making sure that the uh, patient does not have a allergy to sulfa drugs. Um, Rarely will they have one um, bad enough to have a reaction just from a topical uh, drug. But what you want to do is you want to put some uh, mupirosin, investrase, and something else on it. Uh, in the meantime, then uh, skin spot test another area with the silver uh, sulfadizing and see how they do. Wait um, two to four hours, and if no reaction occurs, then use the sulfur uh, sulfadizing as the dressing of choice. If you do confirm an allergy and it's severe enough that you if that is going to uh, cause issues other than, you know, if it was just a little itching or something, that's one thing. But if they're, um, if they are having a more of a reaction, that's going to impede, it's going to increase inflammation and impede healing. Then um, your next choice would be a topical antimicrobial um, in a, um, and that would be silver nitrate, silver nitrate solution. That's, that would be your next best bet. And if you're absolutely forced to, you could do something like mupros or mastropacin, but you really want, um, either the silver uh, sulfadiazine or the silver nitrate, because not only is it antimicrobial, it also helps uh, restore the bearer and it helps um, it helps with epithelialization. So these are all, all good things about it. So if you can't remember anything else, just remember burns, silver, sulfadiazine, okay? All right. Going a little bit more in depth into debridement. So little small intact bl blisters you can leave. They don't have a propensity to, for getting uh, so infected that uh, we need to worry about. They they have a le less likely chance of getting infected basically. Um, and uh, basically the blister environment, if it's completely intact, small and intact, it serves as a sterile biologic dressing. So um, it prevents desiccation, usually uh, can prevent pain as well. Um, when it pops, then bacteria love uh, the goop inside. Uh, they, they, um, it's a really good environment for bacterial uh, breeding, especially if you leave that uh, loose uh, popped blister on top. Um, so you don't want to do that, okay? So if the blister pops, you want to debride it, okay? Um, 
The, uh, so if you're leaving a blister, you want to protect it from trauma, observe it uh, every few hours to make sure it doesn't pop. So really counseling patients about this. Uh, okay. If they're impatient, it's much easier to do on, on your hand. If Again, if it opens, debride. Um, you don't want crusting to seal over the wound, causing closed face infections. Debridement of blisters is essentially painless, uh, so long as the blistered skin is uh, cut and not peeled or torn. So you don't want to peel or tear it back. You want to cut um, with uh, a sharp pair of uh, sharp pointed scissors. Um, and don't <laughs> try not to let the scissors uh, touch too much the uh, underlying skin because, if it, you know, again, blisters, you're getting more of the superficial partial um, burns and those you can still feel uh, they hurt. Uh, quite a bit more. So you want to be very, very gentle um, with these. And then once you debris it, you go, you wash it and you um, sulfur sul sulfidizing and dress it as you would with everything else. Um, make sure when you are doing a debridement to uh, brace their hand against the table or cloth or something and use uh, Use your elbow or something if you think they're going to pull away, especially with kids. Be very careful with kids. It's going to be way less painful if they don't suddenly jerk their arm and rub the burn or tear the skin that you're holding or anything like that. So uh, have parents help you hold kids if you need to or really just talk to the patient and be like, hey, I'm going to make this as painless as possible. All the skin is, is dead and this isn't going to hurt to cut this or anything. If you can't handle this, let me know and we'll figure something out. But you, you mainly want to just make sure they're not going to jerk and cause bigger problems for you. All right, let's talk about outpatient. Um, so for first degree burns, often these uh, individuals won't even go into the ER. So um, outpatient, if you're a family med doc and that sort of thing, you're gonna be the one taking care of them the most or they're gonna take care of it themselves at home. So this is also if you or your kids or family or anybody else um, has first degree burns and you wanna manage it yourself, this is kind of, kind of what you're doing for it. Um, Vast majority of victims uh, don't require hospitalizations. If kept clean, usually heals spontaneously within uh, three weeks with acceptable cosmetic results, meaning not really any scar formation, anything like that. Unless they have a history of hypertrophic scar formation, you're probably going to have a good cosmetic result. Um, you do need to make sure that you are uh, properly assessing and saying, hey, yeah, this is a first degree or superficial partial burn and not something deeper and treat it um, without a, enough proper care um, because you won't get the same same cosmetic results and you want to want to be sure you're properly assessing and properly treating. Um, for uh, the victim, the, consequ the consequences of uh, mistaking um, what level you're treating, like um, mistaking a uh, deep partial thickness burn for a superficial part partial thickness or first degree burn, if it's over a joint, it can cause joint dysfunction. Um, those deeper burns can cause hypertrophic scarring if it's not properly cared for. Um, you just need to be careful that you're, you're tr you know what you're treating and you're treating it appropriately. Um, although first degree uh, burns are very painful, um, victims rarely seek medical attention for them unless the burn area is extensive. So most people will just wrap it, put some uh, neosporin on it, and just kind of deal with it at home. Um, the control of pain is pretty much your big thing with these patients is aspirin, aspirin, or if they're just. I'm honestly, uh, with the way things are going nowadays, I would not use codeine um, for these smaller burns. Um, the potential of narcotic abuse, even if you're only getting it for two to three days, can be quite high. So only if it's in a place that they are not able to protect while sleeping, constantly rubbing it, it's really deeply affecting their sleep and psyche. And even then, you're only using it for a couple of days. Um, and you just want to be very careful how you use narcotics. Um, and again, if there's any chance there was smoke inhalation injury or anything, uh, foregoing it, uh, narcotics until they've had a full exam in a couple of days and you've, you've made sure that they're okay. You don't want to cause a cardiovascular crisis. Um, for topical medication to apply, um, there's, you know, there's tons of stuff out there. Um, there is quite a lot of evidence that aloe vera gel um, actually helps quite a bit. Basically what it does uh, is it has uh, antimicrobial properties and it also has anti-thromboxane properties. So it can prevent uh, any more coagulative necrosis of that area and it can help promote healing and, and uh, good vascular flow and that sort of stuff. So it, aloe vera isn't just a homeopathic thing. It's, it actually works quite well, especially for more of the superficial partial thickness to um, to first degree burns. So yeah, uh, that's a good thing to have in your medicine cabinet. I mean, you can put the silver sulfidizing cream just like everything else on it. Um, maybe a little overkill for uh, first degree, maybe not for um, partial thickness, but 
uh, yeah, you have a little bit more room to kind of navigate around this without, you know, messing anything up, having to worry about scar formation, that sort of thing with first degrees. So superficial part, partial thickness burns. Um, if there are uh, blisters that have popped or loose skin or anything like that, these uh, do need to be debrided. They can uh, adhere back down. They can cause um, basically closed spaces that um, bacteria can seed into and cause infection. So you do want to debride them. They, also, when you leave these pieces of skin intact, intact and stuff on top, it in, interferes with epithelialization. Uh, so you can get uh, slower uh, wound healing time. Um, you can leave smaller blisters left intact. Um, kind of just depends on uh, how you feel about it. Um, if they're if they're strong, intact, and unlikely to um, um, pop anytime soon, and you don't feel like you're gonna have to have them come back in and debride it, then you know leave intact. Otherwise, just go ahead and debride them, drain them, cut them, uh, debride them. Um, after debridement, um, you can use uh, one of the newer synthetic dressings that contain elemental silver. There's a bunch on the market, uh, Aquacel IG, uh, Acticoat, uh, Mep Mepilex. Um, basically, all of these have that silver component. And the nice thing about these is that they can stay on the wound for one to two weeks and the patient doesn't have to continually redress and all that. The bad thing is if the dressing gets dirty, you know, they still might want to change it because patients don't feel good when they have a dirty dressing over a wound. Uh, and then also it's a lot, it's also more expensive than just doing sulf silver sulfadiazine and um, just wrapping it with like gauze. So honestly, um, if you want to, unless you're in a burn care facility or something like that, don't, don't bet on prescribing it uh, uh, and having a patient pick it up or anything. If you have it on hand, feel free to use the longer lasting ones. If not, just use uh, silver sulfadiazine, send the patient home with the tub, teach them how to uh, redress and wash and uh, recoat once a day and just leave it at that. Um, for small facial burns, fast trace anointment may be a better choice than uh, silver sulfadiazine because it can be a little less drying um, to the face. Pain management is pretty much handled the same way you do for the uh, first degree burns as uh, basically analgesics. Um, aspirin and, and the like. And then um, you can also only use uh, narcotics if it's really indicated, completely unable to sleep, that sort of stuff. And you're only using it for a, a couple of days. And then after that, you're not, you're not doing any type, type of long-term uh, pain management with them and narcotics. Honestly, um, I, if you're a family med doc, I wouldn't uh, prescribe the narcotics at all. I would not refill the narcotics. If you're an emergency med doc, I would give them maybe a day or two just to help them sleep while they're kind of getting over that initial burn. But after that, it should be it sh they should be finding other ways to kind of manage their pain at home. Um, opioids is not the solution. Um, Okay, uh, your patient should return every two to three days until the wound is uh, healed uh, or the patient has fully demonstrated the ability to change the uh, manage the wound without your supervision. So basically you're checking, make sure the band is, is clean, that uh, they've been washing off the silver, sulfadizing, replacing it. You'll know because this, it, it turns the bandages like super bright red, and, or not bright red, sorry, uh, super uh, bright yellow uh, if left for a day. And then it gets really dark, musty yellow the longer you keep it on. So it can get kind of nasty underneath. So just making sure that they're willing and, and show the capability to properly manage their wound and that they're they're doing uh, fairly well with um, conservative pain management. Um, if uh, silver sulfadizing is used, um, appropriate regimen is to clean the wound once daily with tap water and soap, reapply the topical uh, sul silver sul sulfadizing and the light dressing. So we already went over that, but just kind of putting that in there. Uh, one last time uh, and really uh, focusing in on the patient knowing that, hey, we don't want this to get dry. You don't want crust to form over it. You want to keep that washed off because that will keep you from healing property. It could uh, lead to bacterial infections and that sort of stuff. If the silver sulfadizing isn't quite enough, which it is, it's it's really goopy stuff, and and you really goop it on um, when when you're putting it over. Make sure they're not they have they can have you know a couple of wraps of the um, whatever um, gauze or anything they're using over it to kind of help uh, keep um, air and airflow and stuff from it, and then also. Um, you can use Vaseline uh, mixed in with it a bit as well to, to make it a little bit more of a barrier um, for them. Deep partial thickness and full thickness burns um, are pretty, pretty much a grave concern 
um, you really want to treat these patients inpatient at first. Um, and you, you kind of have to be on top of it with uh, multiple times a week seeing them, at least in the beginning. Um, a lot of these patients, you, you want to get them into elective surgery as soon as possible for skin grafting, um, skin remodeling, and that sort of stuff, uh, especially if they have any kind of joint involvement, because that can make or break uh, their joint mobility in the future. Um, really getting them into physical therapy early on, even though it hurts, if they keep doing that joint mobility, they'll be much more likely to have mobility in the future, rather, if they let uh, scarring um, continue to build up and form, they can um, it can create a lot more pain in the future. It can create impede, uh, it can impede their uh, mobility. So this is something you really need to be on top of uh, and make sure they they understand. Like, hey, this is going to be a process. We will get you as close to good as possible, but you really need to work with us, and, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of stay with you every step of the way. Um, Healing of even a small uh, full thickness burn can t involve many, many weeks of discomfort and disability. Um, so just kind of giving them an idea of what to be aware of. This isn't going to be pop back, you know, hey, we're we're here on Friday. I'll be back at work on Monday. No, this is something that you have to work with them with. Um, also, have, if you're emergency care working with them, you do, do need to get them over um, to their uh, family med so they can also be doing ongoing uh, stuff with them or burn care, whichever one is going to be doing that. And then also if they can get workman's comp, that sort of thing, um, that their family med knows that they do need to be on top of that to, to get that paperwork process for them because they won't be able to properly function with a lot of these wounds. Um, small wounds can be treated through... Um, uh, surgery, basically. Larger wounds over more dynamic areas usually can only be uh, closed with a day or two of hospitalization. So basically, small wounds you can close up within a day. Large wounds you have to, you, you're going to take a couple of days and you're healing through contraction. If you're doing skin graft, it's going to take several days of them being hospitalized to get that pr uh, proper uh, integrity of the skin, the, uh, skin so they don't um, kind of go backwards uh, in their healing process. Um, you really want to do an aggressive approach with these patients um, so that they can have the future of being pain-free, have normal joint function, and have better uh, cosmetic results. Uh, patients who you let kind of sit for a couple of weeks, have joint contractures, have uh, problems healing, that sort of thing, this is going to be an ongoing battle for them for months, months and months and months, possibly a lifetime with pain and stuff. So um, being aggressive uh, closer uh, on intake rather than uh, deciding to be aggressive later is much, uh, much, much better. Um, should uh, excision and grafting uh, be acceptable to the patient? Um, uh, then the uh, kind of standard method of daily cleansing, the application of sulfidizing uh, cream and stuff uh, is kind of the way you go. So after you do the grafting, after you do the skin remodeling, that's kind of how you care for it afterwards. Um, most full thickness burns need grafting uh, at about three to four weeks after their injury, um, just because you're not able to get a proper um, epithelialization over even by contracture. Um, Deep dermal burns should be seen by the physician frequently during the healing process, and active physical therapy is crucial in ensuring the successful outcome, which we'll go over here in just a second. Okay, so yeah, we've kind of gone over all the outpatient status. Basically, what you need to know is um, superficial, partial thickness stuff can be pretty much taken care of well on an outpatient status, uh, even a family docs clinic. And when you're getting into the deep, deep partial thickness and full thickness burns, know that you're going to need a, the patient is going to need a good relationship with either um, a surgeon or their wound care doc to really make sure they're getting the best, best outcome. All right, and for my final slide, I just wanted to quickly, briefly go over rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is a big part of the burn process, especially with people who have uh, 15 to 20% or more uh, total body surface area burns, and especially if it goes over a joint. I know I've said this multiple times, but um, uh, if a burn goes over a joint and heals improperly, you're going to have impaired joint mobility that affects them the rest of your life. Early physical therapy can prevent this. So basically what you're doing is you're forcing an elastic component into those new growing tissues um, 
and you're making sure they have enough uh, range of motion and suppleness uh, to the newly growing in skin that they are not going to be uh, impeded with any kind of uh, activity in the future. Also, if you have that hypertrophic scarring uh, from lack of mobility during those early times, you can also lead to a lot of uh, pain in the future as well from that scarring. So this is something uh, to be acutely aware of. Um, and then there's also the psychological component, especially with any burns dealing with the face, uh, torso, uh, anything that is very cosmetically impairing. Uh, really being work, work with your patient, find them uh, um, support groups to work with if there's any in your area. Uh, making sure you're, you have somebody in-house or, or somebody you can have do behavioral counseling with them, check in with them. If you're a family doc, you take care of all this, just see them frequently uh, during their healing process and um, make sure you're really checking in on them. and, and and, 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 you know, paying attention to also the psychological aspect of everything. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, talking about uh, how, uh, how the healing goes, burn scars uh, require approximately about a year to fade, soften, mature. Uh, really advise your patients at the, after the point of healing to be very, very um, liberal with uh, any kind of sunscreen on those scars. Because if uh, those scars tan, they're going to tan uh, darker. Um, or even lighter um, than the rest of the, the skin or surroundings, so it can make it much more obvious. So using lots of sunscreen, sunscreen in the general area of those scars. Um, it, it, there is some evidence that using pressure, pressure garment therapies, like compression socks, that sort of thing, over scars uh, can prevent hypertrophic scars from developing. So patients who are very worried about that or have a propensity to develop those, that's something uh, to be on top of. Um, hy hypertrophic scars is kind of a, a discussion in and of its own. You can use some corticosteroids later in the game and that sort of thing to, to topically to, to kind of make sure that those hypertrophic scars don't uh, form as thick. Um, if they do form, you can use Kinolog injection, that sort of stuff to kind of soften them, that sort of thing. But that's uh, kind of a, another discussion. But yeah, just make sure that um, you are uh, giving them uh, full uh, compass of care, or at least referring them to, uh, to uh, others who can give that to them um, so that um, they are, are getting all of their, their modalities uh, treated. All right. Oh, thank you guys so much for listening to me today. This is the first of a two-part series. This one was all about burns. The next lecture is all about uh, frostbite and uh, non-freezing injuries. So kind of the fire and ice perspective. But um, yeah, thanks for everything. I'm a uh, newly graduating uh, fourth year at Rocky Vista University, just matched into family medicine in Billings, Montana. Um, yeah. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you have any suggestions, uh, personal experiences, corrections, please leave them uh, as well. Or if, uh, you know, there's any updates to any of this material or things that you think that others uh, would benefit from, please leave it as well. But uh, yeah, all this information can be found in our box, uh, Wilderness Medicine Textbook, or and also at the uh, Advanced Wilderness Life Support um, textbook from University of Utah. Thanks so much.